This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation with James O'Brien. Four minutes after 10 is the time. I will begin this morning where I always begin, which is with a word upon the existential threat under which almost all Jews in the world live, particularly in many ways the Jewish people living in Israel. It is a country born of centuries of persecution. It is it is a haven, and therefore it is very, very difficult for many, many people to see anything done to protect that haven from real and obvious danger. Never has that danger been more real or more obvious than it was on October the 7th. It is very, very hard for very, very many people to see anything done to protect that haven from threats. And it creates an environment exacerbated by deeply irresponsible journalism and politics often elsewhere in the world. But it creates an environment in which, as we have been saying on this program with the heaviest of hearts since about October the 8th, it creates an environment in which unscrupulous and morally corrupt politicians desperate to save their own skin, politically speaking, can undertake actions that are unconscionable and do so with more support than they would receive in perhaps any other religious, geographical or cultural context. And we knew it was going to happen. Listen, when I seem to have some sort of powers of clairvoyance on the program, and I started saying to you very, very long ago, not long after the terrorist atrocity of October the 7th, that eventually the question will probably boil down to how much death is too much death. Um, it's not because I'm possessed of particular perspicacity. It's because I really, really listen to what you have told me over the years. So I completely understand the nature of that existential threat. And I do think that it is unique to Judaism. I know that there's persecution elsewhere in the world. I know that there are massacres and holocausts and um, uh, appalling atrocities inflicted upon people for the sin of having been born under the wrong star. And I, I've said many times, I would much rather live in Israel than live in Gaza or the West Bank. So it's not about a hierarchy of victimhood. It's about history. And I understand that, thanks to you. I didn't when I started doing this job. I didn't understand it. But it doesn't and cannot equate with unquestioning and complete support for anything that Israeli politicians or Israeli soldiers do. And just, just by way of introduction to the conversation we're going to have together today, we have on this program in the last, sort of it's about 10 weeks, isn't it, give or take, it, we have in the last 10 weeks been accused almost equally of being, and this is a quote I see quite often, Zionist shills, right through to last week being accused of Jew-hating and anti-Semitism. And I'm not always a great admirer of the idea that if you're being equally criticised by both sides in a deeply entrenched debate, then you must be doing something right. But thanks to you and the lessons you have taught me, we have got this right. We have reflected and reported Israel's absolute right and need to respond in strong terms to the atrocities of October the 7th, and we have been absolutely right to report and reflect upon the very simple fact that there can be too much death. There can be a blurring of the line between retaliation and revenge, and there can be a very real sense that some of the Israeli politicians at the very heart of Benjamin Netanyahu's administration are speaking with support when they talk of annihilating Gaza or dropping a nuclear bomb on Gaza or there being no Palestinian people, uh, no innocent Palestinian people in Gaza, or even in the case of one Israeli politician, there being no such thing as Palestinian people, it, it being some sort of invented concept. And then you come to the events of this weekend. You probably thought it couldn't get any worse 
than the story of three Israeli hostages who had managed to escape their captors, I think, or perhaps had been released, and who, knowing that they would be discovered by Israeli Defence Force soldiers, did everything they could to prove their innocence. They removed their shirts because Mark Regev has explained that they have to remove the shirts of all Palestinian men that they capture, whether they're Hamas suspects or not, just to be sure that they're not wearing suicide vests. Uh, they don't give them their shirts back. I'm not sure he's explained that bit of it. Um, they leave them to be paraded in front of the world in their underpants, regardless of the fact that many of them have no links and aren't even suspected of being members of Hamas. So they took off their shirts to prove, I presume, that they weren't wearing suicide vests. They, they waved white cloths, uh, makeshift white flags, the international sign of surrender. And uh, according to the reports I read this weekend, they, they shouted in Hebrew, um, the, the, uh, the language that would also prove they're Israeli as opposed to Palestinian heritage. And they were all shot dead. And I can't see how anybody who has been or remains supportive of any tactic undertaken by Israel, I can't see how you can process that intellectually except as proof that the IDF is routinely deploying indiscriminate killing of any men, any humans that they come across in the Gaza Strip. I suppose the closest you could come to a compromise would be saying, well, maybe those soldiers who killed those men are just running around killing anyone they encounter. But the, um, the idea that that conduct is exceptional or that that conduct is extraordinary is one that I think events would um, render difficult to sustain. What sort of events? Events like the events in the uh, Holy Family Church complex on Saturday, where according to the Latin Patriarch, Arcade of Jerusalem, and as the Cardinal Archbishop of Westminster, Vincent Nichols, said earlier today, why on earth would he lie? A mother and daughter were killed inside the Holy Family Church complex, one of them apparently going to the toilet, and another Christian woman, they've been named as Nahida, and her daughter Samar, walking into a, to, towards a building in the church complex. One was killed as she tried to carry the other to safety, a statement said. Seven more people shot and wounded as they tried to protect others inside the church compound. The patriarchate said no warning had been given and added they were shot in cold blood inside the premises of the parish where there are no belligerents. He also said that earlier on Saturday an Israeli tank had fired on part of the church compound where 54 disabled people were sheltering. Leila Moran, the Liberal Democrat MP, has family in that church complex and has been highlighting this story in a harrowing fashion all weekend. The number of journalists killed in the Gaza Strip is half of the reason why so little reportage comes out. The other reason is that journalists can't get in from traditional international news sources. One line about um, it, if, if Israel wanted to, they could raise Gaza to the ground is a line that could only be uttered by somebody who hasn't seen pictures of what has happened in Gaza already. The notion of displacement being some sort of mild corrective or some deserved collateral damage to the broader picture is objectively disgusting. Uh, I don't know what it is that you use to define your culture. I don't know what you derive your sense of personal and political security from. But I'll tell you something for nothing. The roof over your head is quite a crucial constituent of who you think you and your family are. And the roof goes. Even if the roof remains physically, the fact that you can be ordered to leave at the drop of a hat or encouraged to leave before the bombs start falling, it robs you of any sense of certainty. It's as if the foundations of your life that reach into the metaphorical ground between your feet have been severed and you're left floating, drifting, with no sense of being tethered, no sense of root, no sense of permanence. That's an incredibly traumatizing experience. And the people enduring that trauma in the context of Gaza at the moment are the lucky ones. They're the ones that are still alive. 30 minutes after 10 is the time. So, so the list today is 
are, are, are incredible. The list not only of atrocities, but also of criticisms, critics. David Cameron joining France and Germany in calling for a proper truce. Uh, the Pope himself describing some of the actions of the Israel Defense Force as being akin to terrorism. The Latin patri Patriarchate of Jerusalem describing two Christian women being killed in cold blood while walking to a building in a church complex. Church is, of course, historically a uh, place of sanctity and sanctuary since pretty much Christianity appeared on this planet. Quarter past ten is the time. So, so, so we're here. We're, we're at the place where we said and where we knew we would be. We're at the place where if you want to continue supporting what Israel is doing in Gaza, you have to admit that you don't care how many innocent people die. You have been robbed of any protection from that position. You have been robbed of any camouflage that would save you from having to say that. And of course, if you're not prepared to say it, you've now been robbed of any good faith observer knowing that that is the only way you can still support what is going on. Extraordinary, really, that we've watched the death toll tick up, wondering at which point Western powers Western leaders would step in and say enough. That, that's all it's been. I don't know whether it is the nature of some of the deaths that we have seen this weekend or whether it is the slow seeping of footage and photographs into the public space, the, the slow realization for disinterested observers of the sheer scale of the devastation and the destruction but we have sat here on this program, and you know that we turn our attention to this subject as often as we reasonably can, and always with a sense of dread and horror. We have sat here waiting for the point at which it becomes impossible to pretend that you are either in favor of ethnic cleansing in Gaza, or you are against it. And if you want to dress it up in saloon bar semantics, then you say something like, well, what would you do to stop Hamas? Because you haven't got the guts to say, I support the ethnic cleansing. I support the ethnic cleansing of the people of the Gaza Strip. That is, I think, where we are. I would love to be wrong. So, explain to me why I am on 0345 6060 Seven, three. Tell me, please, that I'm wrong. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 18 minutes after 10. I often try to remember to share with you some of the things that have um, uh, directed my thoughts on, on difficult mornings like this. It's a, it's a rather splendid piece of writing in The Guardian today by Nezreen Malik, who simply says, I will start this column with a question for you, dear reader. What connects you with your country and makes you feel it is yours? What gives you a sense of identity and belonging? It's the physical things, of course, where you live, where you were born, where your family and friends reside. But underlying those practical aspects, I, sus I suspect, are things that you don't think about, that you take for granted. The music, the literature, the humour, the art and cinema and TV, the more abstract touchstones of an identity that form a connective tissue between you and your country. I ask, she writes, because the corollary of the question, what makes a people, is what erases one. And I find myself in the horrible situation this morning of believing that there is an attempt underway to erase the Palestinian people in the Gaza Strip. 0345 6060 973. 20 minutes after 10 is the time. Do you? Do you agree? Do you disagree? If you disagree, then you have to accommodate the latest developments. The two women shot dead in a Christian Catholic church complex. The Pope using the word terrorism that um, any other world leader currently remains frightened of, of course. And an astonishing interview in the Financial Times with the uh, United Nations 
uh, um, direct, uh, deputy director general, I forget the, the precise terminology, in which he describes it as being the, uh, the single worst humanitarian crisis he has encountered in 50 years. I'll read you a bit of that as well, actually, before we go to the phones. Many places have terrible suffering, but at least those affected can flee. In Gaza, quotes, people can't leave. No family can plan for their future. I see these things all over the world, but this is beyond my imagination, and it will get worse. In the, he talks of the human catas catastrophe entering a new phase, and I quote, it is disease, hunger that is beginning to be the lead cause of death and deprivation. The death toll from disease could be multiples of that from fighting and airstrikes, but the latter may also have been dramatically undercounted so far. And yet still you hear lots of people in the British media saying, oh, you can't trust these numbers. We've yet to see what's under the rubble. These estimates of around 18,000 dead, once you start digging under the rubble, the statistics change radically. In the case of February's Turkish earthquake, the number of the dead doubled. This is Martin Griffiths, um, who also states in an extraordinary interview with Henry Mance of the Financial Times that the war in Gaza isn't even halfway through. So if you are still in support of it, that is now what you are in support of. And I think, I think you have to admit that now, don't you? Chris is in five. Chris, what would you like to say? Good morning, James, and thank you for having me on. Um, I just want to say that it's very difficult to see where we've got to today without the lens of what you started your programme with. We've had weeks of uh, desperately unfortunate people being bombed out of their homes and whatever, and suddenly the story... Try and improve your phone line, Chris. I can't hear what you're saying, but we will, we will come back to you, I promise. Hassan is in Cambridge. Hassan, what would you like to say? Yeah, look, I think uh, the, the level of uh, um, death is, is shocking, and they're going to skyrocket, uh, not only because of the people in the rubble, but because of easily communicable diseases. We've had sort of amputations. We've had all sorts of horrendous injuries. People were already, 95% of them didn't have uh, uh, clean drinking water. We can just imagine what the scale of uh, the uh, disease count is going to be. I think what is unfortunate is that the Israeli hard right government had been making that very clear from their genocidal statements from Ben Kavir, from Netanyahu's Amalek, from uh, the president of Israel talking about their no civil, uh, no mm. innocent, innocent civilians. civilians. Yeah, this is there, and and it is clear when they shoot. Uh, uh, people under a white flag trying to surrender. It's clear when they shoot women. Trying well, to we only we only children. know about the people yeah. under a white flag being shot on this in, occasion because they happen to be Israeli hostages in the process of escaping. Yeah. Although the yeah. hu Human Rights Watch has detailed many other instances before this conflict of. Uh, yeah of the white flag being being ignored. And of course, you know and I know, Hassan, that it, it, you know terrorists can wave white flags too. Yeah, but this is not the first time in a war that this has happened. I mean, uh, white flags and misuse of white flags are centuries old. But you don't start shooting civilians, uh, you're not trigger happy. I think what has been happening is, if you look at the scale of the bombardment, right, and because the Israelis know exactly what is a church, what is a, uh, what is a school, what's a the hospital, their plan was to make Gaza uninhabitable. They're, they're telling to people in Gaza, you know what, if you really want to live here in, in tents where half of the schools are destroyed, half of the hospitals are destroyed, bakeries are gone, sure, go right ahead. But we are going to make it completely unlivable. And, and, and then you how, look how, at... How could, how could anybody demur from that position now, do you think? I, 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 I don't... I don't want to be unkind because because yeah. of the the, the, the the points that I opened the program with today yeah. and because of the, the, the pertinence of existential, constant existential threat. But how can you watch the events of this weekend and not conclude that that raising the area to the ground, that that robbing the, 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 the people of their very sense of self is is not the plan? No, I was listening to uh, another radio channel yesterday, a far-right uh, radio channel, and they were 
full of how Israel has been the victims for centuries. What can they do, um, etc.? Uh, they have no choice. They're trying to be well, very. You could say uh, that. You can say I don't. I don't. Yes. I don't. I don't like the glib tone yeah. that you've adopted. You can say that about Jewish people without any fear of contradiction. You can't obviously say it about a state that's only existed in its current form since 1948. But but doesn't that rhetoric always lead? whether it's explicit or implicit, to the insistence that Israel can do whatever it wants. Yes, and, yeah. and I think this is what these people are advocating. And so when, they, when the Israeli ambassador lets the cat out of the bag that they have no interest in a two-state solution, they'll start talking about how Arabs and Palestinians are not really ready for a second state. This is like colonial era, 1950s, Mandarins talking about how black African countries are not ready for statehood. So this is the, yes. the, uh, the mind point where these guys are at. I think it's clear. I think Biden is feeling the pressure uh, of his electoral uh, potential defeat. I think David Cameron and others are now going to uh, follow lockstep. And even Keir Starmer will suddenly discover the merits of a ceasefire because that's what the Americans are now pushing. And, everybody and it's, so, it's, so, it's so bleak, isn't it? It's so bleak yeah. that, that it is just the point at which it's almost as if the it's almost as if the vessel has overflowed now with Palestinian blood and therefore people are calling for something that could have been called for much earlier. Some people did call for it, of course. Um, but the notion of the objectives of the Israeli Defense Force or the Israeli government being the eradication of Hamas and the release of hostages is, is obviously unsustainable now. They failed miserably to target the people at the, at the heads of these organizations. You think back to the sort of Mossad death squads of the 1970s and 80s, the sort of intelligence that the rest of the world used to watch with shock and awe that, that Israeli operatives could go into the heart of enemy territory and take out senior operatives. That's a joke, the idea that that's what they're doing. And the idea that they're there to rescue hostages when they are shooting them dead is also impossible to sustain. Um, 27 minutes after 10 is the time. James, you are so wrong, says Russell in Northwood. There is no evidence of ethnic cleansing. Even if the deaths were four to five times the current level, there would be no evidence. I think you're getting genocide mixed up with ethnic cleansing there, Russell. You don't need to kill people to ethnically cleanse them. You just have to remove them from the land and the homes and the places in which they live. So I, I, I think it would be wrong to use the word genocide, but um, it's, it's interesting that you misuse the phrase ethnic cleansing while claiming that it doesn't apply here. And Lorraine is in Essex. She says, why don't the so-called people living in the Gaza Strip, there's a phrase I haven't come across before, the so-called people living in the Gaza Strip call out Hamas. It's like the German and Polish people in the Second World War who knew what the what Nazis were doing but turned the other way. Perhaps the people of Gaza are doing the same. They, quote, know, end quotes, what Hamas has done and is doing. Are they still so innocent? Lorraine there, of course, including babies born an hour ago in the uh, list of people whose innocence can be questioned. Bushra is in Twickenham. Ickenham, sorry. Bushra, what would you like to say? Um, hi, James. Hello. Um, I, I feel quite numb at what I'm seeing. I, I, it, it's hard to believe... Um, because I'm, you know, I'm a British person and I'm told that um, the civilised um, superpowers step in when, 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 you know, atrocities are being done. And I, I can't believe what I'm seeing mm. and, and the hypocrisy. Um, but if one good thing has to come out of the hell that the people of Gaza are living through is we all have to wake up to the plight of the Palestinian people because before the 7th of October, yes, I knew about it, but we all carried on with our lives with a, a racist, apartheid, brutal occupation um, on the Palestinian people. Um, where, you know, it's, it's an accident, James, that you and I were born in the UK. Mm. We, that, they are humans. That could be us. Well, for Lorraine and Essex, they're so-called humans, of course. You know, you know, James, I've got children and I can't bear reading the stories before the 7th of October where Palestinian children as young as 12 years old are taken in the middle of the night from their homes 
with, with, uh, with no, um, uh, you know, mm. guilt apart from being Palestinian. I, it's, it's, we, we can't be living our, you know, cushy lives in the UK with, with this happening in the world. You know, we have to stand up for justice. You know, South Africa was in my lifetime. I mean, I was very young. I don't think I fully understood what was going on. But, you know, apartheid was ended in South Africa. Well, when you use the word apartheid in this context, what, what precisely do you mean? Because it's not, it, 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 the South African model doesn't apply it, it, in, in the same way. What, what, what exactly do you mean? Do you mean it, the it, people living in the Gaza Strip are denied the, 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 the most basic rights afforded to the people living in Israel? I mean, James, you're right. It doesn't quite fit. And actually, it, it's worse than apartheid. Apartheid means two people um, who, who don't have the same rights who are not treated equally. And, and you're right. Um, even David Cameron um, is quoted as saying it was an open air prison. Mm. No one can go, a, go in. No one can go out. You know, we have aspirations. We want our children to be educated and um, do something for the world. And these people are not allowed in or out. And nothing is allowed in. Nothing is allowed in without... Um, the Israeli government um, saying so. And, you know, I've... I've oh, I understand. I, I'm, I'm going to be a bit late for the news. I just wanted to clarify that. And and I, I also want to not balance. That would be the wrong word, perhaps. Um, but, but, but counter, perhaps, what you said with a text from Richard. This is now obviously... An, uh, but remember, Richard's listened to the same 30 minutes of radio that you have. This is now obviously an anti-Semitic show because you never had calls in call-ins like this about Syria, Yemen, Afghanistan and China who all murder and persecute Muslims. You simply hate Jews. Richard, it's, it's, it's because of holding Israel in a higher regard than we hold the Taliban or Bashar al-Assad or the uh, genocidal maniacs in Yemen or the murderous Chinese regime and its approach to the Uyghurs, it's, it's precisely because we hold Israel in a much higher, or we have much higher hopes of them than we do of the terrorist organizations that you've just compared the Israeli government to while calling me somebody who hates Jews. Just step back for a minute, Richard, and have a think about how your brain got so badly boiled that you could have written and sent that text without understanding what you were doing. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 10.35 is the time. Um, it, it, it is, it's horrible, I imagine, to have your love for your country, your, your support for its aims and your need for its security and its safety exploited and abused by the government of your country, in this case Israel, so horribly, because I don't see how anyone can avoid the conclusion that they have now been pushed to a place where not only do you find yourself on the other side of history from everybody, from the Pope to David Cameron, but you also um, can't really avoid the accusation that you are, and possibly always have been, in favor of what looks and sounds like an attempt at ethnic cleansing in the Gaza Strip. You know, some people called for it. Some, some people said right at the start, raise it to the ground, Western commentators and Israeli politicians. But I think perhaps we're frightened of it. And, and Richard, who was comparing the Israeli government to the Taliban a moment ago while calling me a Jew hater, um, he, he perhaps doesn't realize that or doesn't understand that the, uh, the Israeli politicians explicitly calling for it and not losing their jobs, have rather given the game away. 10.36 is the time. Uh, Ali's in Barnet. Ali, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Um, I'm just shocked at everything that's going on. I'm just disgusted that the IDF spokespeople still hold on to the idea that the blood of all these innocents are on Hamas's hands because they use them as human shields and that they get away with murder because they say that they didn't intend... Uh, or target to tar or that they don't target civilians as if if I had a gun and closed my eyes and just as long as I hoped to shoot someone bad and it didn't matter who was well hit. actually do you know that's one of the few things that I, I've forgotten or not forgotten I've been overtaken by events to to, to share on air because um, American intelligence last week revealed that just uh, just under half I think of the bombs dropped are not uh, they're called dumb dumb bombs or dummy bombs and there's no control over where they're going to land or who they're going to kill so the idea of sort of surgical strikes carefully calibrated to take out very specific targets 
Um, it, it's absurd yeah. in the most densely populated area. And there's a reason why it's densely populated, because over the history of this particular piece of land on Earth, they, the, the Palestinians have been pushed further and further close towards that region, and that's why it's the most densely populated. And they either genuinely believe that um, they don't intend to hit civilians um, and hold on to that thought so desperately to justify their massacres, yeah. or alternatively, and rather more depressingly, they don't believe their own lie, and it's just designed to help them get away with murder. Uh, and that they're just bloodthirsty and so blinded by vengeance that they'll deliberately target oh, it's, it's, areas full of citizens. Yeah, um, it's, it can be. We can be a tiny bit more generous than vengeance. It, it, it can be that you, in protecting your, let's just bring it down to brass tacks. If you honestly believed that by killing my family you'd make your family safer, then there's a strong case there for you to kill my family. Yeah, but it's like, and then, but now what's their excuse? Because now they've killed their own civilians. That they were, this was what their argument was pinned on, and was sort of, yeah. that was their core sort of reasoning, which was that we're trying to get our hostages back. But you could back. chalk that up as now well. That's colla- that's hostages. that's the real collateral damage, I presume. If you if you're still supportive of this um, campaign, if you're still supportive of these tactics, then it's very sad that three Israeli hostages who we were trying to rescue got shot by the soldiers trying to rescue them while waving white flags, having taken off their shirts to prove that they weren't suicide bombers and shouting in Hebrew. But that is number one, it's the fault of Hamas and number two it's collateral damage in pursuit of the greater goal and the greater goal is not, I don't think, the eradication of Hamas or the capture or the release of hostages, but you could say increased security yeah. for Israel. And then that becomes an intellectually defensible position, if not perhaps a morally defensible one. And, and it's just it's just shocking to me because, I mean, and, and for us as a country, as, as Britain, have we not learned from the past? I mean, how is it that we're on the wrong side again? You know, first it was Iraq. It took a million deaths to realise that that was the wrong thing to do. And it's almost like we shoot first and then look to talk second. Mm. And I remember uh, watching a video of Tony Benn uh, a a while back um, saying, you know, don't Arab and Iraqi women weep when when their children are killed. You know, there's bombing, uh, I think he said, fortify their resolve or, you know, what fools we are that... This, these sort of wars are just an interesting Channel 4 news item, he said, and just a, a, an interesting game for our, for our children to play at, you know, on their PlayStations and stuff. I think you know, we, this is the second time round something's happening, and ha- should we not have learned from that? How is it that every country, well, majority of all the countries on Earth, understand that and, and are united in saying we need to stop this, and the whole thing is being halted by a couple countries and and we are just sort of following america in to every sort of bad scenario doesn't matter if our you know we we tarnish our sort of reputation as a country that uh you know well i, I mean tarnish it with who I, I i suppose that would be would be the question if you were to be conducting diplomacy in a moral vacuum you 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 argue the importance of being in lockstep with america particularly um after We've cut our ties or cut many of our ties and our, our, our deep historical diplomatic cooperations with, with European allies. 10.41 is the time. Thank you, Ali. Johnny's in Edgeware. Johnny, what would you like to say? Um, well, first of all, I'm, I'm, I'd like to say I'm, I, I'm a supporter of Israel personally um, so and what I. they're trying to do. Oh, that's where, um, we, that's where we part. That's where we part. Well, I, I'll say the following. For any Israeli or any soldier that's shot anyone indiscriminately or and certainly a civilian they should be held accountable and there are cases many cases in israel where there have been terrorists who have been disar- disarmed and then someone in the idf has gone and shot them still and they have been put in prison in israel that's what happens so the fact Sorry, that does, and i'm not sure just, to be just, honest just, with you, i don't quite exactly understand to, what you've just told me I mean, you can take all the time you want johnny there's no rush what, what, okay thank you <laughs> you're talking about so been, terrorists in in israel in and, israel there've been cases where terrorists in israel have been shooting and israelis uh, israeli soldiers have been present and disarmed them and then another soldier has gone and shot that terrorist and yes. those and that person from the IDF has been held accountable. Yes, but that's in Israel. Put in prison. No, uh, my point uh, that, is... That's that in Israel IDF, where, is, where, where everyone can see it happening. 
Correct. Because there's My no journalist banned. There's no journalist banned from Israel, so you wouldn't be I'm able to you. sweep that under the carpet, would you? But I'm in Gaza, you. I'm with you. Yes. I'm with you. My point. My point is, is that if someone has shot and killed a civilian, or in this, in this case, Israeli civilians, and they were the IDF that's done it, and they have no justification and had no threat towards them, they should be held accountable. But when we but, look at the, but they're not the, being, the, the they? situation as a whole. I can, I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna have to be a little bit strict with you, and, and, and I, I, I hope you appreciate that that's fair. But you can't say I support something because I believe that something should happen. You can only support it if that thing is happening. Correct, I agree. And it's not. I agree. I'm, I, I, all I'm saying is well, that it, no. Hang on, it, it's it, not happening. They're not being held accountable. Nearly half of the air-to-ground munitions that Israel has used in Gaza have been unguided. They're literally Unguided called. They're called dumb they're, bombs. There's no control or, or, or discretion over where they land at all. There, there is discretion. They've been, they've been warning civilians to move from one side to the other side, and Hamas not allowing them to move from one side to the so other because been, they want as much. They well, there's want no, as many civilians there's no, dead as possible. There's no evidence of that of them being prevented. There's no evidence of Israel warning. No, there's the no evidence of people moved. being pre- prevented from moving. But if even if there was then telling people of a specific ethnicity to move out of their homes is pretty close to ethnic cleansing, isn't it? Why, why, why is that the case if, they, if, they, if they've got Hamas terrorists hiding in their homes? And well, there's no Hamas terrorists what? in the Holy Church complex. How do you know? That's because it, I'm, because, I'm interested you know because the Latin patriarchate of Jerusalem said so, and they'll be in daily contact with the people who've been shot they dead. They weren't there either, either. It's in a church in Gaza. So then you've we got are, some I'm people, been... then you've got people in direct contact with the Christians in that complex saying there are no belligerents here. And then if, pe- if, people like you, case, with respect, proven, Johnny. If, no, wait a sec. No, 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 I won't wait a case. sec. I won't wait a then sec because we can't, be we, we can't keep spouting from one position to another you can't keep saying they should be held accountable they are not being held accountable which means that your grounds for supporting what is happening have have disappeared from beneath your feet in the course of a single i know you disagree but i'm just telling you what everyone else can hear if you explain let me explain why the the general goal of what israel are trying to do is they have to carry that out. If you had Hamas on your border sending rockets for the last 17 years to you, you'd also realise that they have to. So get there rid we are. So, so 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 you are supportive of everything, including two women not, being shot not, dead just, by no, snipers. Just, no, because it, not at all. If Israeli, if particularly Israeli soldiers have gone wrong and done something wrong, that doesn't mean the whole general cause is it is it question at all. The general cause. Well, what do you think after, a war crime is? A war crime. There could be a war crime. This this particular instance. But that wouldn't make that wouldn't that wouldn't affect the general cause, though. So, how many war crimes do you think would affect the general cause? Uh, I don't know. It's a good question. But on the whole, ninety percent of what they're doing is trying to get back. They were shot in cold blood inside the premises of the parish, where there are no belligerents. Three Israeli hostages shot dead, waving white flags, having taken their shirts off. So, what is it that you are? What is it that you think you are supporting when you ring in to me today? I'm supporting the eradication of Hamas, and I'm supporting. Well, how's that going? Why? Why? What? Pretty well. I think they've. There's probably. I, I, 20, 30,000 Hamas soldiers or whatever they're called, at terrorists, and they're probably doing quite well in getting rid of them. At the same time, they're trying to free up the hostages. What, one thing I don't but, understand... But, but all we know is, about the hostages they... in the last 48 hours is that the Israeli Defence Force shot three. And, yes, and, the, I... and the wide analysis, the wider analysis of the pursuit of Hamas leaders is considerably less optimistic than yours. Although I appreciate you weren't expected to be asked about it. So we can't claim that what is happening in um, uh, it, it, the, the church compound uh, in Gaza, or we can't claim that the oldest mosque in the area, the Omari Mosque, 5th century Byzantine church, which was destroyed earlier this month, St. Porphyrius's church, the oldest in Gaza, damaged in another strike in October, dis- displaced people there, 57 disabled people in this 
um, compound which was set on fire. They've now lost electricity. None, none of that can be justified on the grounds of no, trying. It, it let, can, let me finish, please. Let me finish. Hamas, none of that can be. That no, you, it no, can be. And we've okay. seen Hamas terrorists. None of that all, can be justified. In all of these places. So if Hamas are hiding, so if Hamas are hiding in a building full of disabled people, you support Israel bombing that building and killing everyone no, in it. I su- I, so I what do you Israel support, Johnny? To, to fight those Hamas people. So just what like do you support? The British did the same thing. Everyone, this is war, and this that's why the Geneva Convention was invented to stop them from doing it again. So, here is a building full of disabled people. You think there might be some Hamas people hiding in it, even though there is no but, proof, and everybody I, I, I there. No I'm going to finish, Hamas Johnny, and everybody there says there isn't, and you support bombing it and killing everyone in it. As Everyone long as, as long Hamas as, terrorists. when it turns out, you know when it turns out there were no I terrorists people. in there, as long as everybody is held to account, Johnny. Am I right? How, 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 how do we know? How do you know there are no Hamas terrorists? We've seen them hiding in schools, in, in churches. We've seen so it, you are. Why are you arguing with me? So you do support bombing a building full of disabled people because there might be some no, Hamas terrorists in there. I don't. I support shoot. I, I, I support trying to shoot terrorists within a building like that. Otherwise, you could say otherwise. The what patriarchate said you, that earlier on Saturday, an Israeli tank someone. fired on part of the church compound with 54 disabled people inside. It caused a fire that destroyed the building's generator, the only source of electricity. And, and some no, of the disabled and you, and you people know, fact, and no some of the disabled people can there. no longer use their respirators. That's very sad. It's a terrible Isn't tragic... Isn't it just, Johnny? It yeah, is indeed. And, but whose responsibility is... Who started it? Was Israel the, firing the, the, on Hamas on the, the 6th of The person that fired the tank no is responsible com- for that. No, and the, no and the people that fired the guns on October the 7th are responsible for what they did. But if you want to well, argue okay. that Hamas is responsible for what Israel is doing, then you put yourself in the same intellectual position as the people who argue that Israel is responsible for what Hamas did. Are totally re- re- responsible for what they did. Because before Hamas went into... I, I, I'll say that again, because I, re- he- I don't think you heard it. If you want to argue that Hamas is responsible for Israel killing innocent civilians, you're in the same intellectual and moral space as people who argue that Israel is responsible for Hamas killing innocent Israeli civilians. Why? On what basis? I'm going to leave you to think about that. I'm going to leave you to think about that, Johnny. All They've right. been firing rockets for 17 years into Israel. Yes, yeah, yeah, I know you keep saying that like it's meaningful or, 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 or some sort of... Um, mantra, but if you want to say that Hamas is responsible for Israel killing civilians, you put yourself in the same moral space as people who claim that Israel is responsible for Hamas killing civilians. And I, and I think probably for you today, that's that's the most important lesson that you'll learn. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 10.53 is the time. I, I've been thinking a lot about trust um, on on the issue of support, I, I, I take some of your criticisms very seriously. A, a lot I completely ignore, because the only conscience I ever answer to is my own. Um, and so, when we first started covering the latest crisis in the Middle East, and many of you were very unhappy with me on October the seventh and immediately afterwards, as I explained and described the necessity of a of a serious and robust response from Israel. Um, and you talk to me about history and you talk to me a, a, a little like the last caller repeating the mantra of of rockets coming out of Gaza. So so the repetition of the um, uh, uh, incarceration of Palestinian people in the Gaza Strip constantly offered up, just always falling slightly shy of claiming that it justified the atrocity. Very unhappy with me for describing and explaining uh, Israel's position, but I put trust in Israel. This perhaps is the point that Richard missed, who was comparing the Israeli government to the Taliban a moment ago without realizing. That's that's crucially the point. And the last caller, essentially equating himself with the people who would claim that what Hamas did on October the 7th was Israel's fault. And in his defense, the British media is full of people still claiming that what Israel is doing in Gaza is Hamas's fault. But to me, they're morally equivalent positions to claim that the terrorist atrocity on October the 7th was somehow justified by um, Israeli behavior is is akin to me until you explain to me why it's different is exactly the same to me as as claiming that what Israel is doing to innocent civilians in Gaza is all the fault of Hamas is all the responsibility of Hamas but it's trust 
And I think that the Israeli government has betrayed the trust of people like our last caller. They're just not quite ready to see it yet for all of the reasons that I've explained to you many, many times and endlessly. It's trust. It's what you mean by proportionate. What does proportionate mean? It, it, it's trust. There is a trust. Trust is an intangible, isn't it? It's non-fungible. Trust. It's abstract. And knowing what we know about Likud in its current form, knowing what we know about Benjamin Netanyahu and about many of the people he's been compelled to bring into coalition government in order to cling on to power, largely in part due to fear of criminal persecution in the event of him leaving power, you probably, we probably shouldn't have trusted them with our support. But we did. And look where it led. That, I think, is why it's very, very hard to put forward a, a cogent argument for Israel's continuing tactics in the Gaza Strip without sounding, even if you're not yet prepared to say it out loud, without sounding as if you think they all deserve to die. Which clearly some people in the Israeli government do, because they've said so. Bob's in Brig, in North Lincolnshire. Bob, what would you like to say? Good morning, James. Hello. A bit of background first. Of um, shortly after I graduated from university, I am Jewish. I went out to Israel and worked in a kibbutz. Okay. Um, I was blown away by what Israel had accomplished in a relatively short time. Yes. And I was chuffed to pieces to be, as it were, associated with the country. That's 50 years ago. Since then, I have become increasingly skeptical, disillusioned, with the way in particular that Israel has treated the Palestinians. Um, I have relatives in Israel, and if you like, I have skin in the game. Yes, but I, I am appalled, not uh, obviously, I am appalled by the way that the Israeli government has behaved. It is an extreme government, and I think that what is happening at the moment is the culmination, really, of... 50 years of not sorting the problem out. I've got no solutions, I'm afraid. But what I am afraid of at the moment is that what is happening now, and I, I couldn't agree more with your analysis of it, it has to stop. It's appalling. But the, there's going to be a knock-on of anti-Semitism. Because if Palestinians are being blamed for all that Hamas does, mm. well, why not blame all the Jews around the world for what the Israeli government is doing. It and, is and, not... and both positions are toxic, and yet it, it, it's so yeah. hard for people who are even close to one of those positions to recognize that they put themselves in the same place as the people they profess to despise. It's so depressing, Bob, isn't it? It must be understood that it is not anti-Semitic to criticize the Israeli government. It is humanitarian to do so. It's all, I mean, it's also a central bedrock of any semblance of, of, of democracy, isn't it? It's freedom of expression in its, in its purest form. But I felt the same. I mean, people might understand the parallel with this government, that when I was a child, I was chucked to pieces. I'm British. You know, what an accident of birth. And now we have an appalling government um, that I don't want to be ashamed of to be associated with you're ashamed of that. I'm ashamed of what's happening in Israel in the same way, and it's very depressing. Well, thank you for your honesty, Bob, and, and, um, and, and also your reminders of the importance of being able to change your mind when the, when the facts change. I, I'm boxed into a slightly uncomfortable and unfamiliar position by your critique of our government, which I think holds true, but David Cameron this weekend called for a, for a meaningful truce joining German and, and French voices. And, of course, Ben Wallace, who was the Defence Secretary until 10 minutes ago, we got through a whole hour of the programme without mentioning this. He has warned that Israel's tactics, current tactics, risk fueling the conflict in Gaza for another 50 years. Now, Ben Wallace is not a sage. He's, he's not a genius. Nobody is going to be 100% right about 100% of the things on, uh, on this issue. But to think where we were two months ago in the context of questioning the scale or the or the quality of Israel's response to that terror attack um, and where we are today when a senior conservative MP and former Secretary, State, Secretary of State for Defense writes in the Daily Telegraph of a killing rage. If Benjamin Netanyahu thinks a killing rage will rectify matters, then he is very wrong. Um, and David Cameron calling for a sustainable ceasefire. I think that's the phrase, isn't it? What you're supporting now 
is a killing rain. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It is three minutes after 11. Um, the tactics of Israeli Prime Minister, Mr Netanyahu, would, quote, fuel the conflict for another 50 years. He added, his actions are radicalising Muslim youth across the globe, which, uh, which lefty apologist could we possibly be talking about today? Well, we're not. We're talking about the former Secretary of State for Defence and senior Conservative MP, Ben Wallace, before we set the terms of the next hour of conversation, we're staying on this territory, but perhaps with slightly different perspectives. I want to read you quite a long message from Debbie, who's in London. James, I find this almost too painful to listen to. I am an observant Jew living in London with family and friends in Israel, where I have spent much time. And like so many British Jews and indeed so many Israelis, I am totally agonized by the present situation. I find it so difficult to think a military solution is possible and personally would hope for a political resolution and a two-state solution. Nevertheless, I despair that this is not possible and whatever happens, it is difficult to see how it will help life for British Jews and more importantly, life for Israelis, let alone Palestinian civilians. I pray that people have the necessary courage. Thank you, Debbie. Um, Courage. And trust are the two words that have popped into my mind today. Trust, because I was thinking about people pushed now to a position where they're defending Benjamin Netanyahu's killing rage, as Ben Wallace has called it, while having to pretend to themselves, remember, because you can't pretend to anybody else unless you're pretending to yourself on a subject like this, that there is some sort of justification for what they are now supporting. But, of course, courage to think a little bit about Northern Ireland um, as we contemplate this. Some of the reasons for doing so are perhaps a bit spurious, you know, uh, or perhaps not, but the idea of the British government responding to an IRA terror attack by going into, for example, a Catholic area in Belfast and killing everybody there because that's where the terrorists were hiding um, is, from some angles, not a million miles away from what defenders of of Benjamin Netanyahu or where defenders of Benjamin Netanyahu have have ended up. Um, Richard, a different Richard, um, the world agrees with the concept of self-defense, James, but the issue in Gaza is nothing but revenge. Uh, You see, I I think, I don't know where my accent went then, it sounded a little bit Cornish. I think that the line between revenge and self-defense is for Israeli people Actually, a little bit more complicated than that, mate. I, I, I think that if you have a threat on your doorstep, then removing the threat is self-defense. Because it, 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 it's, it's well, what would you call it? I mean, it's attack being the best form of defense, actually, to, to be a little glib for a moment. And I do, I, I, I don't care who it upsets, to be honest with you, but I do and always will consider the modern state of Israel to be unique in that sense, not only because of the historic sanctuary that it offers from centuries, if not millennia, of persecution and pogrom, but also, crucially, because of the existential threat that it lives under every day from its closest neighbours. But that, of course, cannot be used to excuse comparable behaviour in the opposite direction, which is why I, I think, in terms of penny drop moments, I think today's is probably the realisation that to claim that Hamas is responsible for what Israel is doing in Gaza is intellectually and morally the same as claiming that Israel was responsible for what Hamas did in Israel on October the 7th. Um, 11.07 is the time. 03456060973 is the number that you need. So Ben, um, Ben Wallace says, if Netanyahu thinks a killing rage will rectify matters, then he is very wrong. He's been Defence Secretary under three Prime Ministers, which is quite extraordinary given the speed with which they change jobs in the uh, current administrations. He um, said he was not calling for a ceasefire with Hamas, but warned that Israel needed to stop its crude and indiscriminate method of attack. Now, calling it indiscriminate... um, would have got me called a Jew hater last week. 
So I suppose you can extend that description to Ben Wallace if you want, the former Secretary of State for Defence. But at some point, you're going to have to wonder whether perhaps you're on the wrong side of the argument. And the eradicating Hamas argument, which has always seemed spurious, is again addressed by Ben Wallace when he says that the current tactics of the Israeli Prime Minister would fuel the conflict for another 50 years. His actions are radicalizing Muslim youth across the globe. And not just Muslim youth, actually. I, I think, you know, the humanitarian abuses will affect many, many humans, regardless of what star they were born under. And Netanyahu, accordingly, continues to insist that, the, uh, that they will stop at nothing in pursuit of their goals. It is eight minutes after 11, and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Um, phone lines are open. Talk more about Netanyahu. Is killing spree, revenge spree, is that a fair description of what Israel is doing in the Gaza Strip? I fully accept that it, it, it doesn't have to have been that at the start, but now, watching what we're watching, seeing what we're seeing, hearing what we're hearing, knowing what we know, can you really challenge the former Secretary of State for Defence's analysis that what we're watching is a killing rage? And the idea that that will rectify matters is, in the words of Ben Wallace, very wrong. So that's a Conservative Secretary of State for Defence under three separate Prime Ministers, the Pope, the Cardinal Archbishop of Westminster, the Latin Patriarchate of Jerusalem. Um, I want to get this fellow's job description correct, the Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs at the United Nations since 2021, Conservative Foreign Secretary, all now providing a very real sense that the point we on this programme have been discussing almost since this nightmare started has now been reached. The pivot has, has, has been reached, the point at which we are saying this much is too much. Ten minutes after 11 is the time. Frederick's in Thamesmead. Frederick, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Uh, you know, this doesn't surprise me. If you remember back when this first started mm. and President Biden gave his first comments on this issue, he was saying how the West supports Israel. And he also said, which I think is probably the most redundant statement I've heard this year, <laughs> is that Israel has the right to support it, so, you know, defend itself. Yes. Well, of course, that's, <laughs> that's definitely the understatement of the year. Yeah, I do well, know. I didn't clock that at the time. But it's, it's, I mean, because I don't think we ever really encounter anybody serious who says Israel doesn't have the right to defend But what I noticed, James, when he made that statement is he never referenced the Palestinian people. And later yes. on, I think his staff pointed that out, because if you remember, he came back later on and kind of added that to it. But I, but when he made that first statement, I literally said to myself, he's just given Netanyahu carte blanche permission to completely destroy Gaza. Mm. So what we see happening now doesn't surprise me, because when you started seeing the bombings and how he was destroying this diff the various cities and telling people, oh, you need to move, well, there was no infrastructure in place because he completely destroyed it. And I thought to myself, just using a practical example, and you kind of referenced this in the previous hour, if the police here are chasing the most heinous criminals and they go into a block of flats, yes. do we allow them to just destroy the building without considering the residents of the flats? No, we don't. Of course not. So why do we allow Israel to do this in Gaza? So what we're seeing doesn't well, the, surprise the, I, me at all. I, I, I think it's a little late now that everyone else is coming around to it. But I was thinking this at the very beginning. Well, you weren't clairvoyant. Your, <laughs> your, fears, your fears have been proven. But, but you yeah. weren't. We, no one could be sure. Not, not completely sure, because no one has the power of, of, of reading the future that this was going to happen. No, but you, you could know, certainly, in the case of... Or anything either, no. but, but knowing Netanyahu, and I thought well, to myself... Well, that's the point, isn't it? Knowing yeah, Netanyahu, I think, exactly. is the point. This is not the Israel people, because if you remember, both sides were saying, we want peace. But he was determined, he was going to destroy Hamas, but he was going to destroy Gaza at the same time. Because he yes. was just bombing. So this and do you know, I wonder, all. actually, Frederick, I, 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 we've got this enormous luxury of, of watching from 
thousands of miles away. But, yeah. but, but we have a responsibility, I think, not to turn our eyes away. But I, I do wonder whether the difference between rhetoric and reality is kicking in now for a lot of people. The difference between the words of, of support and an absolute right to defend itself, which can't be sustained in the face of what we are now seeing and what we are now mm. witnessing. So you might have had a, a theoretical commitment to the idea, whether you were prepared to say it out loud or not, that Israel can do whatever it wants in, in pursuit of its ends. Yeah. But now you're seeing what that actually looks like. You can't continue with that conviction, I think. Well, I think, well, I think at the beginning, people were so upset and, you know, what they were seeing when Hamas attacked and was killing all of these people. And you can understand they kind of, you know, we'll just kill them no matter what. But at some point, you have to kind of step back and plan your defense a little bit more strategically yeah. instead of just randomly bombing the place. And I think that's what, you know, um, you've heard various commentators say about 9-11, what yes. America did. Yeah. You know, they just went in and just started bombing the place. You have to learn these lessons because what you're going to end up is millions of people, innocent civilians, being killed. And for what? For what? That's the question, isn't it? For what? For, 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 a, for a slightly enhanced sense of safety or security for a relatively brief period of time because nothing that Netanyahu is doing is going to secure permanence, I don't believe. I, I, again, I, as with Frederick's words, I'm, I'm open to correction. You're open to pick over anything that he has said. But I think that Ben Wallace very wisely has made the conversation about Benjamin Netanyahu now. And I think, thanks to Frederick, um, in part, we shall do the same. That's the point, isn't it? Also, I'm getting a lot of calls in response to Debbie's message as an observant Jew with family in Israel. It's, um, it, I mean, that's a weird position to be in because so much of the criticism of criticism of the Israeli government leeches immediately into bogus allegations of anti-Semitism or, or Jew hating. Um, it, it, it must be, you, you become a self-hating Jew, don't you, under that analysis in some cases, albeit on, on this occasion, I mean, not least uh, the, the, some of the protests, some of the anger at the Israeli government spilling onto the streets of, of Tel Aviv on Saturday after it emerged that the country's military had mistakenly killed three hostages in Gaza who had a stick with a white cloth on it. You heard the spokesman in the news saying, well, nobody really knows what's happened. It's so bizarre that these men and women are permitted to come onto the British media sharing their absolute certainty about what the other side does, has done, and will do in an unknowable future. And yet, the actions of their own side can never be taken at face value or believed because there is always room for dispute and there is always room for dissent. And, and the, the failure to pick up on that by some interviewers is pitiful. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It's 18 minutes after 11. That Miriam Kate story looks very interesting. I don't know anything about it, but she is being investigated by the Parliamentary Commissioner for Standards over claims that she has caused, and I quote, significant damage to the reputation, end quotes, of the Commons and its members. How the hell can you cause significant damage to the reputation of the House of Commons in its current form? I, I, I'm being a little bit mischievous when I ask that question, but goodness me. How, how on earth can anyone cause significant damage to the reputation of a House of Commons in which Jonathan Gullis and 30p Lee Anderson routinely start grunting from the back benches? What would you, what would you have to do? We've got a Secretary of State for Defence who came to prominence in this country by selling get-rich-quick schemes on the internet under a succession of false names. And it didn't dent his rise through the ranks of the modern Tory party one jot. But somehow, Miriam Cates has allegedly managed to cause significant damage to the reputation of the Commons. This is a Commons from which Nadine Dorries resigned with immediate effect and then didn't go anywhere for two months. How can you cause significant damage to the reputation of a House of Commons that's got room for Jacob Rees-Mogg to sprawl out on a front bench like a sort of wilting sunflower? I do not know. I don't know much about her either. And I can't read this with a straight face. And I hope I never do. Ready? A co-chair of the New Conservatives 
one of the five families of right-wing factions within the Tory party. I still don't know whether the five families are a fiction of Mark Gamamboni Francois's imagination or uh, a figment even of his imagination or whether they all do really call themselves that. But she's been in the headlines recently for uh, thinking that Rishi Sunak's so-called Rwanda bill uh, had too much human rights in it. And she also captured the media's attention, it says here, sounds like a bit of a euphemism, by claiming that the declining birth rate rate in the UK was down to cultural Marxism and too many people going to university. Well, she sounds lovely, doesn't she? I'm surprised she's not the Minister for Common Sense who uh, features on the front page of the Daily Mail today because she's going to be clamping down on political correctness and wasting taxpayers' money. Whoa, that's a new one. I've never heard any of this lot promise to clamp down on political correctness and wasting taxpayers' money before. Have you? However, all of that pales into insignificance when compared to the latest evidence of Sir Keir Starmer's unfitness for office as revealed yesterday by the Mail on Sunday and their uh, magnificent political editor, Glenn Owen. Can you imagine what shame, what shameful revelation they have unearthed to prove Keir Starmer's abject unfitness for office? I'll give you a clue. Woof! That's your clue, okay? Would you like to hear that clue again? Did we record it? Can we play it out? You could use Global Player and rewind live radio because you're always in control. But no, I shall give you another clue. What do you think the mail, uh, the client journalists at the mail have um, uh, 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 established as yet more evidence of Keir Starmer's super unfitness for office? These are the lads, you'll remember, who dedicated 13 front pages to a perfectly innocuous curry. What do you think they've got? Oh, and also tried to malign him for buying a field in which his disabled mother could keep distressed donkeys down with that sort of thing. Boris Johnson, of course, serial adulterer and lawbreaker <laughs> and, of course, liar to the House of God. I bet you've got to watch that. I'll give you that clue once more, shall I? Once more. Woof. Slightly different tombra to the last clue. 22 minutes after 11 is the time. A little light relief, but we return now to the... Very serious matter. I, there's a pivot today, actually. So we're talking about Benjamin Netanyahu and why it is so important to zone in on him and his administration rather than to allow flabby criticism to be about Israel, which can then conflate with the Israeli people or even with all Jews. This is about what the government of Israel is doing. And most Jews, most Israelis are no more responsible for what Benjamin Netanyahu decides to do than you are responsible for Rishi Sunak abolishing bins. John's in Southminster. John, what would you like to say? Good morning, James. I just like hi there. I just like to um, sort of say that Mr. Netanyahu's intentions uh, and his persecution of what's uh, occurring are basically um, um, in your own time John you sound, you yeah, sound a bit distracted mate have you got something else going on have you no, got no it's all, I'm just trying to get get my thoughts aligned yes very <laughs> wise I mean no, I shouldn't um, criticize you because on this no, subject no, no, more than any other sorry um, Mr Netanyahu doesn't fear the consequences yes of what he's doing he doesn't fear them for his people he doesn't fear him for how he looks in history. I think myself is probably going to go down as a revisitation of Herod, as a massacre of children. Um, but he doesn't worry about that. And the reason he doesn't worry about that is because he's operating under licence. And unfortunately, we've seen... You mean licence from the West? Right. And from yeah. the, the UN, you can't have a body called the United Nations where a vast majority vote for a reappraisal on a ceasefire mm. and countries get to veto it. The terms and conditions of that body of people will be that if you're going to be out of veto, it, you need to give us good good reason. Well, I, th I think that's the role of the now, Security Council, isn't it, R rather than any ordinary member and that, you know, there's an argument for the uh, 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 post-war alliance or the post-war settlement being increasingly out of date. But, but the the precedent of veto is is quite a well-established and most would argue important 
check and balance on mm. on 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 the United Nations, which is an imperfect institution. But to a complete outsider, looking at those numbers last week, ten against and a hundred and thirty mm. odd, I mean, it would be impossible to explain, wouldn't it? Really, it, it is. It is um, impossible to explain. And then then you have to sort of look at okay, the functionality of the whole thing is it is it fit for purpose? Um, the the license I'm talking about is the one for Mr. Biden to think about because he put those two aircraft carriers in the Eastern Mediterranean. Now, if he was to withdraw them beyond beyond operational range, he might find that Mr. Netanyahu thinks, hmm, might give him right, pause. I'll, I'll, I'll at least talk. <laughs> no, I'll well, that, that, that is it. I mean, that's the next stage, isn't it? We've plotted each each stage of this tragedy uh, and, yeah, and the next it, one will be because the next one can't be it can, well it may be it can but it, it, the next stage will be what does netanyahu do when he loses the full-throated support of joe biden and and to a much lesser extent other allies and i think i think we're on that now aren't we were in the yeah. foothills of that process today literally yeah. today mm, i think i think it's a, it's a it's a terrible price for humanity to pay for one person, one male of the world's population, to be able to walk away into obscurity as a politico. Having done it's a, hell of, a hell of a price to pay. Especially if Ben Wallace is even half right about the legacy, the 50-year legacy of, of radicalisation and hatred that will not serve anybody well, but least of all, if Wallace is right, least of all the Israeli people who Benjamin Netanyahu claims to represent. Thank you, John. Alex is in Aldershot. Alex, what would you like to say? Hi, um, James. Um, there, but it's such a complex situation, and this is not said as an excuse, but because the solution will not be easy. So to demand when we say don't bomb children to respond, well, what do you want them to do? Well, it will take time, but most certainly the solution cannot be bombing children, and the solution cannot be hating all Israelis or all Jews or mm. all Palestinians mm. or all anyone because we should focus on the act, condemn acts, not people, and we should condemn leadership and not civilians, and we should not murder civilians. The arguments I hear is, well, the civilians are there. Yes, they're there. They're in Gaza. They're not in some vast land. They're not the United States where you can separate maybe. This is a tiny, tiny piece of land. So it's easy to say that Hamas is using children as shields. Do they, though? The way they say goodbye to their children, I'm not exactly seeing. Well, uh, there is, there is, there is, there is some evidence of that, there, and there is it some is evidence so. of, of. If somebody holds a shield with two children, no, on I, them, do I'm you not know you're, like, you're, no, well, yeah, I, you're, 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 well, we're back to the point Frederick made about pursuing heinous criminals into a block of flats. The argument that you'd then blow up the whole block of flats is. It's just spurious, isn't it? I mean, it, it, you could argue that that 21st is... 21st century warfare. We got robots soon doing Remember in Iraq? Job. In Iraq, they said they could put a missile through a window. Yes, it was that easy to... Do you remember that? The technology that they possessed, Back they told then. us. Yes. That they could, put it, they could put it through a specific window in a specific building in the heart of Baghdad. And no one's received more military support from, from America, I don't think, than Israel. So I, it, it, the debate, the longer it goes on... The odder I feel, actually, because the first thing that we stumbled across today was the similarity between claiming that Hamas is responsible for what Israel is doing to any claim that people did make that Israel was responsible for what Hamas does. They're, they're very similar. You make the point quite beautifully about Palestinian children and Israeli children having a hell of a lot more in common than they do apart, and the idea of hating all of them on either side being utterly if we want a better world, we must stop doing that. Yeah, we are not entitled right. to block a Jewish person from a loo. And we're not entitled to shoot the Palestinian university student either. We, we cannot. And that's, we cannot that's what international law is things. supposed to do. That is what international law and the international community is, so, is, is supposed to provide. I, I wonder also, Alex, and you've just prompted me to, to, to think this as I glanced towards my inbox while you were speaking. I wonder if you do feel a profound hatred towards everybody in Palestine or towards everybody in Israel, then you have to accuse everybody else of being the same as you. So you have to, you can only justify what is happening. You can only justify a terror attack or a massacre or an ethnic cleansing or whatever it may be 
by believing that everybody like you and me who claims equality or equanimity must somehow hate their sides. I, I mentioned that because this dropped while you were talking. You came out criticising Israel on the 13th of October, barely a week after October the 7th. Does that not explain your entrenched hatred of the state of Israel? What I did on October the 13th, if, if, if the date is correct, is, um, is start worrying that the direction of traffic, my friend, was heading to where we are today. So I'm afraid it's far too serious a subject for me to tell Keith to get the I told you so tin. But what I started doing on October the 13th was expressing very real and profound fears that the tactics being deployed by Benjamin Netanyahu and the license being given to him by Western leaders would lead us to precisely where we are now. So there's your lesson for this morning. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 11.32. I, I, I don't know, do you scream at the telly much? Do you scream at the radio? Except when I'm on, obviously, I scream at it all the time. I, I had to double-check this. I saw Oliver Dowden being interviewed yesterday when he said that Gary Lineker should swim in his lane or something. I did wonder for a moment whether he thought Gary was a swimmer rather than a footballer back in the day. But you sort of think, obviously, it's Oliver Dowden talking, so you have to have a, a, a modicum of um, recognition that the man's a complete flump. But, I mean, it's quite scary when members of government tell citizens not to express political opinions, isn't it? And then I thought, I thought, didn't Boris Johnson put Ian Botham in the House of Lords? Ian Botham, of course, a famous cricketer. whose heyday coincided, I think, pretty much with Gary Lineker's on, on the football pitch. Didn't Boris Johnson put Ian Botham in the House of Lords, I thought? And then I thought, yes, he did. And I looked it up and I was reminded of the fact that, um, and indeed I've been reminded again by Matthew, who's, who's tweeted a, a thing I hadn't seen before to me. Not only did Boris Johnson put Ian Botham in the House of Lords, Liz Truss made him a trade envoy to Australia. Liz Truss made Ian Botham a trade envoy to Australia. And yet for Oliver Dowden, who obviously has been in the same governments as Liz Truss, Gary Lineker, uh, sharing essentially evidence-based and compassionate opinions about government policy and government language, should somehow be silenced, or at least uh, Dowden should call upon him to be silent. Um, if you wonder why Ian Botham ended up in the House of Lords, you, you'll get a point here. So he actually said in, in an early interview after being ennobled, anyway, I'm enjoying it and we'll be at Westminster more often when we get back to normal, especially when they are debating something I know about, like sport or the countryside. <laughs> Not much point if it's a trade deal with Japan. And the interviewer asked him, what about Brexit? We find ourselves in different corners on that. And Ian Botham replied, that doesn't matter, mate. We won. So that's the kind of former sportsman that can be put in the House of Lords, where he can laugh about knowing nothing about trade and then can be made a trade envoy to Australia by, just checking the dates, by, it would have been Boris Johnson in August 2021 when Liz Truss was still... Um, faffing about pretending that the trade deals she was signing were valuable or special or consequences of Brexit, a tactic now fully adopted by Kemi Badenoch. Adam's in Walsall to steer us back to the conversation about Gaza. Adam, what would you like to say? Uh, hi, James. Hello. Um, if you are a country who claims to be the only democracy in the Middle East, as Israel has done so many times, yes. if you claim that, you have the world's most moral army, which Israel has done so many times, then we are then allowed to question when you guys don't um, act that way, act as a moral army. I mean, I'll give you one example. Israel, in the last 20 years, has arrested, uh, have put into military detention over 10,000 Palestinian children. In the last twenty years, I haven't got, I haven't got, I haven't got that in front of me. I, 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 and you know, I don't want to sound like Mark Regev, but I can't take everything. You like your sources, don't you, James? Pardon? You like your news sources? I do. Yes, I do. Times dot com article yesterday. Kenneth Roth, who was the ex director of Human Rights Watch, put it on his tweet. 
Back. Um, so I've, I've been looking at that today. I've been looking at the human right Kenneth Roth's feed today with regard to yeah. white flag deaths and the killing of Palestinian civilians exactly. during yeah. during Operation well, Cast article, Lead. Uh, yes, okay, uh, thank you. Uh, and it's a Times, uh, Times article. When you also have an army who, back in the 2018 to 2020, during the peaceful protests, when Israeli soldiers had a competition as to who can blow the most, most kneecaps, the most kneecaps that were blown was by a soldier who claimed 52 kneecaps. So when you have soldiers like that claiming stuff like that, and again, that was... But I, 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 listen, Adam, I, I could now, I don't want to now take a call from somebody reminding us about the atrocities that Hamas visited upon Israeli civilians on October the 7th or, or on other occasions. So I just mentioned that because I do focus these conversations quite carefully on questions that I have given quite a lot of thought to. And it's why, unlike other radio phone-ins, we generally avoid catalogues of uh, 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 catalogues of tragedy and atrocity being Rem being reminded of by people with loyalties to either side in this conflict. So, yes, the Israeli army has clearly done terrible things and, for many of us, is now doing terrible things in Gaza. But similarly, um, Hamas and, 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 and Hezbollah have done terrible things to Israelis over the years. So I don't know how helpful it is to pursue this sort of atrocity tennis like with the early caller richard who's saying this has become an anti-semitic show all i'm saying is we're allowed to criticize if you guys claim that you're the most moral army or you're the most democratic country, yes, but, but we're talking it's... about what's happening today and i don't i don't i don't i mean i may well, well need a history lesson but i don't i don't want it now and and this question of whether or not netanyahu is on a killing spree some of what you've shared could be i think construed as context on that but um well, just tell me whether you agree this army, when you see the videos where they, uh, they're in people's houses or they're smashing the shops or they're making fun of kids' certificates in school or when they're even putting their flags up around Gaza. I mean, do you remember when the Americans, when the statue of Saddam came down and an American soldier put us... I don't know that you've taken on board my, my polite request that we zone in on the situation in Gaza today because we're, we're talking about Iraq 20 years ago now. Well, I'm talking about... But this, the, the army is, it doesn't care about what the world thinks. Okay. If they are brave enough to put videos up on TikTok about what they're doing around Gaza, you know, is this, a, is this an army that cares? I mean, they even shot their own citizen a few weeks ago in Israel um, when he had a gun and he was actually on the ground with his arms up because uh, a Palestinian had just killed two citizens. The army turned up. He, yeah. was, he had a gun. Again, and... I, again I, I've let you get the bulk of all of these stories across because I, I don't want you to feel that you're being curtailed. But I do have a phone-in show to present and you haven't said anything yet about what's happening today. Have well, you? what's happening today is basically a result of it's, it's about the whole history of the Israeli army and the Israeli government. So everybody it's, it's should have known. Into Ev today, into what's been going on over the last eight weeks. But then you the haven't mentioned the terror atrocity of October the 7th, you see. Yeah, I agree, but it's all culminating. It's not just starting on October the 7th, is it? No, it's been going on for the, decades. The Israeli army didn't suddenly start on October the 7th, but the current attack on Gaza was prompted by the attack upon Israel and the murder yeah. of 1,200 people. I but then uh, Hamas Isn't attacked them, uh, <laughs> was it 2012 or 13? I don't and know. over 2,000 Palestinians. I don't know, but that 2012 and, and, and 2013 are definitely not today. I, I, I'm not being um, critical particularly. I just, I, I just feel that the phone in has been very, very powerful today, zoning in on the, the reality of this moment. And I appreciate the importance of historical context for. Uh, anybody and everybody, and I'm grateful to you for providing it, but, but I do want to move forward now um, into, well, or, or, or at least into the present and this intervention from Ben Wallace and this description of rage killing um, that he has applied to Benjamin Netanyahu. And I do wonder whether or not anyone would like to challenge that, whether or not you'd like to describe it as something other than rage killing. Anthony's in Bletchley Park. Anthony, what do you what do you think? I think I'm exhausted. Um, yeah, good morning, James. Go um, 
Uh, I'm going to have to put a, a, a very brief bit of historical context in, but to answer your question specifically, yes, Ben Wallace, I, I agree entirely that it is blind rage. But also, I think the rage issue comes from what happened on the 4th of July, 76, and that was when Netanyahu's brother, Jonathan, was killed in Operation Entebbe, which was after a French airline got, uh, airliner got hijacked and taken to Entebbe. His brother was the only casualty, and the guys who he hijacked the plane were the pe- the PFLP, the Popular Front for Liberation of Palestine, and the Red Army factions. And Netanyahu is on record saying that his own hard line against all terrorists was the result of the death of his brother. And I think what we are seeing now is the longest revenge act in history. And I think that's why Ben Wallace, who is well-read himself, has actually chosen the words he did. He is talking about blind rage, mm. because I think... I think Netanyahu quite possibly has conflated the disgusting attack by Hamas terrorists on 7th of October and the hostage taking with the PFLP taking hostage of 106 people on the on the Entebbe it, flag I, as well. It, it, well, I mean, neither of us are psychologists. Well, I'm not. You might be, but uh, but but it, I mean, it, it, it's it's a compelling analysis, and I think that Max Hastings, who was commissioned by the family perhaps to write a, a, an official biography of, of Netanyahu's brother. He has shared some pretty grim quotes from those encounters and conversations that he had with Benjamin Netanyahu after his brother had been killed. And we've, we've, we've mentioned them quite a few times on the program. The, the, uh, well, I mean, he may have changed his mind subsequently, but using the next war as an opportunity to get rid of all the Arabs was more or less what he said at the time. Also, Netanyahu's father's on record saying that um, that uh, Jonathan, um, yeah, Benjamin Netanyahu's brother, would express huge dismay and concern at the, uh, I'm quoting now from a, um, a Guardian article, the weakness and indecision displayed by some democracies towards this phenomenon. Mm. And I think that Netanyahu, um, again, I'm not a psychologist, I have studied elements of psychology. I think that something has flipped in his mind and he has got, because he's under huge political stress at the moment, anyway, because he's currently on trial for corruption. I think that once the uh, Hamas terrorists went over the border, something clicked in his mind and he, he said, that's it. You know, no more Mr. Nice Guy if, if such a super case could <laughs> yeah. apply to him in the first I'm not place. sure anyone's ever called him that, but I'd say, t- t- so this is it you now. And, and then you've got other planets aligning. You've got the, 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 the fragility of his own political situation, the escalation of prosecutions and, and alleged criminality and the, um, the, the, the sense of his grip on power loosening. So there would be both historical animus and pragmatic opportunism uh, offered up by this. And of course, most of us, and I include myself, well, I put myself at the top of this list, most of us don't really know how much of Israeli society is, how supportive Israeli society is of everything that Benjamin Netanyahu does. It's a, it's a very odd omission from the news diet, from the news coverage in a, in a country, I'm talking about the UK now, where we, we've got microphones and cameras in almost every corner of the world, except, of course, the Gaza Strip. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 11.48 is the time. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC, where the... Um, I, I difficulties of getting clear beads on situations in the Middle East are, are both d- d- difficult to believe or, or understand and desperately important. Um, Adam in Manchester tells me that 400,000 people were protesting Netanyahu and his government three days before the terror attacks of October the 7th. Um, uh, and there have also been protests calling for the uh, uh, release of people incarcerated by the Israeli government, including children, um, which means someone under 18. I, I heard somebody again say in an interview that wasn't really picked up and said, well, that, that describes everybody under the age of 18. And I thought, well, yeah, that's generally how we describe children. I, I mean, but what, what exactly is it that you're objecting to when that word uh, children is, is described? A, a lot of good coverage around. I can't stay on top of all of it, but there was another... Um, description of Netanyahu. Someone wrote this weekend, perhaps you saw the article, you can remind me where it was. It may have been in the Wallace article, but the, wrote of his shame at failing to predict or know about the October the 7th attack, which which adds to Anthony's analysis there of there being a sort of personal psychodrama in play here. But the question I, I want you to answer really for the remaining 10 minutes or so of this conversation is whether or not Ben Wallace, the former Conservative 
defence secretary is correct and Benjamin Netanyahu has essentially embarked upon a uh, a, a rage killing is the is the phrase that he deploys talking about the radicalizing of youth and fueling the conflict for another 50 years describing crude and indiscriminate methods of attack and that is him describing what is happening now not warning against doing it in the future um, and and that phrase there if he thinks that a killing rage will rectify matters can anyone dispute Ben Wallace's analysis that this is a killing rage. Zara is in Leicester. Zara, what would you like to say? Um, yeah, I just wanted to say... And if you remember... Oh, your we, phone's well, you not good remember. enough. Well, try and improve it. I don't know whether you've climbed a ladder or fallen down a well since you rang in, but you, you, no one's ever put on air without the phone line being good enough. If it becomes suboptimal in the journey from... Uh, speaking to the producer and speaking to me, then it is nobody's fault. So it's important to bear that in mind, even as it gets a little bit frustrating. You want me to try again already? That's very bold. Are you sure? You're rolling the dice. Let's see what you get. Carry on, Zara. Um, yeah, I don't know. Can you hear me now? Yes. All oh, right. Yeah. Um, I don't, you won't remember, but we spoke right a few days after the October the 7th. And even back then, I had said that... Um, are you playing a xylophone in the back? Are you playing a xylophone? I mean, I'm entering. I'm entering Heathrow Car Park. Okay. Um, I was hoping to speak to you way before this. No. But we're here now. Well, I, I, <laughs> I, no. Well, I'd be brief then, if you would, because you probably yeah. are going to have a bad line if you're entering Heathrow Car Park. Oh. Um, yeah. So um, I was. We. I, I said back then that Netanyahu and his government need to be removed if we want peace in the Middle East, and we have seen. You know, well, only the Israeli uh, voters can do that, can't they? Or, or I suppose. No, I know, yeah. I know. But what I was saying back then was that our governments, the US and the UK, should absolutely, uh, you know, apply sanctions, apply pressure for him to behave responsibly. And even back then, it was really obvious that he wasn't going to, mm. and he hasn't. And now his entire government, I mean, not entire, most of his government have come out openly, you know, citing Amalek, citing the destruction of Gaza, saying openly that there will be no two-state solution. And we are still supporting them. I know that there are words like, oh, yes, you must, you know, uh, be a bit more, show a bit more restraint, etc. But that's not enough. Well, Cameron, yeah, so, so, look, David Cameron is the foreign secretary. I still can't call him Lord. And he has called for a sustainable ceasefire. And he has stated that too many civilians have been killed. And I can't yeah, argue with you that they are, they, no, are just, they are just words. I, I completely it's agree. It's not working. No. It's not working. It's not listening. Nobody's going to listen. Aid. We're not sending any more arms. There has to be change now. We and there it goes. There goes the phone line. But uh, you did manage to get across the bulk of, of what you wanted to say, I think. Thank you. Gabriel is in Battersea. Gabriel, what would you like to say? Hi there, James. Hello. Uh, well, I mean, just, just you know, I was speaking to your producer earlier on about the Ben Wallace comments mm. uh, about the killing rage. And, you know, one of the things I mentioned I wanted to say was, you know, why is it just now that the UK government, or P I know he's not in government, you know, he's yeah. the old, um, uh, you know, and now just getting the moral compass right. You know, this, just even as the initial assault was happening, the comments that were coming out of the Israeli government were already quite incendiary and they were, you know, basically indicating ethnic cleansing, in my opinion. You know, we also have to look at all the previous... I don't know wars. that you saw that to start with, actually. I, don't, I, I, I mean, my, my, the, the last critic I read out was um, stating that I started to question Israel's tactics on October the 13th. I may have been a little bit late to the party, but, mm -hmm. but I don't think the... For me, I think the ethnic cleansing question came into sharp focus when they started bombing the bit that they told everybody to move to because it was going to be safe. Yeah, I complete, and look, and I completely agree with that. Another point I wanted to make was, you know, where, you know, we, we always talk about the, the right of Israel to defend itself, which I completely agree with. And I, I now have to state that. Well, nobody you know, doesn't. What, what, I, I hadn't no. thought of that before. It was, a, it was Frederick, I think, who just pointed out what an odd statement that is. There's nobody ever says, well, I disagree with Israel's right to defend itself. It's a absolutely, question of what, what is justifiable and what is not. And that's the question that's defined this entire conversation now for two months. I know. And, and another thing I wanted to point, you know, with that statement about Israel's right to defend itself, why does no one ever mention Palestine's right to defend themselves? You know, every time this conversation goes to self-defense, and I agree, it, you know, a lot of it is sparked by what happened on October 7th. Mm. But 
we never ever speak about, well, what about these Palestinians' right to defend themselves? It seems that the Palestinians don't have a right, and their defense comes from in the international community, not themselves. You know, it's until we get our act together and we decide to call a stop to this violence, then they can actually defend themselves. Because at the moment, I don't hear a single news media outlet saying, well, Israel has a right to defend themselves, and so do the Palestinians. All we're doing is trying to stop a, a massacre. You know, it's, we're, we've got to the point of 20,000 people, possibly more, maybe even double, by some estimates, that people are start, starting to now get a conscience. And even Well, with, I have the United not... Nations warning, that, and this is, uh, you know, Martin Griffiths, whose job is to deal with everything from from earthquakes to wars, and he, he suggests, which is a quite a useful counterpoint to right-wing journalists in this country who um, very rarely question anything that Israel has done, saying that we can't trust the numbers because they've been provided by the Hamas Ministry of Health. Th th this chap from the United Nations, who is the Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs, says history has taught him the numbers are going to rocket when they actually start digging people out of the rubble. Absolutely. And I think I think it was you or the, another caller that mentioned the Turkish earthquake. Um, yes, it was, you know, it was after him. That, uh, after, yeah, that's right. You know, after that atrocity, uh, well, not, not atrocity, after that disaster, you know, you're finding double the numbers. So, you know, at, at one point we have to start talking. And, and another thing, you know, the, the, the Palestinian state never gets mentioned. We're always talking about two-state solution, which Israel's uh, Tipi Hotzevelli, the, was it the foreign minister or the, the, the... She's the British, the, she's the Israeli ambassador to Britain. The Israeli ambassador pretty much said was off the table, which basically means behind closed doors, this is the conversation they're having in the Israeli government. So they never wanted a two-state solution. It's pretty clear, in my opinion. Well, I, I, well, there are. that doesn't mean that nobody in the Israeli administration or in Israel didn't want it. It means that the kind of characters who have thrived and flourished in recent years, as Netanyahu's domestic situation has become more imperiled, that the kind of characters that he's found himself in bed with have been pretty clear historically and certainly more recently on, on that, that question. Thank you, Gabriel. It's coming up to 11.57. Last word on this, I think, to Sophie, who's in Burgess Hill. Sophie, what would you like to say? Hi there, James. Hi, Hello. thanks for taking my call. Um, I, I wanted to point out that um, it's in Netanyahu's interest that this war continues and until the, they're out of the state of war he can't be charged for his corruption so uh, alleged wants, corruption sorry his alleged corruption <laughs> he can't be taken to court how do you know this. that because I, i'm sorry i should know that as well and i've seen references to it but i don't know that i understand it in quite as clear terms as you um, you, you apparently do well, there are some other um, news um, outlets talking about it. So the um, but isn't that that's that's a matter of circumstance? Colleague. That's a matter of circumstance rather than. Of course. It yeah, wasn't sorry, because I thought you were happened. describing it as a sort of constitutional reality, but no one is going to pursue these charges against him, these allegations against him, while they are at war. I, I thought you were speaking of some sort of constitutional. Um, no, a no, mechanism I mean, that meant he, they, that he can't be while he's out. So it's to, sorry, I, I misunderstood you, and now I do understand you. And that is, I think, part of the calculation, certainly. And it's also worth acknowledging that we, we talk about Hamas and the, the atrocities, and it was horrendous. And there are clearly some very sick individuals that are part of Hamas. Whether they were born of a resistance or not, there are some individuals that do need to be stopped. Um, but it is worth acknowledging when we condemn Hamas that we also condemn where they, they came from and their funding because Netanyahu's administration is responsible for them having the power that they have. That, that I think, is a statement of fact rather than opinion, and it's one that many people listening to this, indeed many people covering this, may, may not be um, fully cognizant of. If, if Sophie's wrong, and indeed if, if I'm wrong, then please do correct us both. But, but I think there's some fairly well-documented evidence of, uh, of of what Sophie describes, which again, and, and sometimes, you know, it's easy to uh, take a pot shot at people who do what I do for a living. There's no earthly way we can be expected to know everything. or And that's why I love doing phone-in shows as opposed to other forms of media, because there's always somebody listening who knows more about the subject under discussion than you do. But some people who do what I do don't want to know more. They, 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 they get given their instructions by their own minds somehow. You know, where do you, you struggle, for example, to find somebody who's got a problem with Gary Lineker, who hasn't offered up fairly full-throated support for, for Israel and also thinks the National Trust should stop advertising or explaining more details about the role that slavery has played in the creation of the fortune that created the house that you're currently visiting. All that, and, and unemployed people are always taking the mickey. I don't know why Israel, or, or, or unquestioning support for Israel appears on that list, but they're not deliberately um, 
avoiding knowledge or avoiding facts t- deliberately. They've probably forgotten, for example, that Ian Botham was put in the House of Lords by Boris Johnson. I suppose in defence of people who don't seem to understand stuff, sometimes they really just don't understand stuff. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It is three minutes after 12. And uh, Vinny says, hi, James, absolutely loving the coverage. But can we please discuss moaning Michelle Moan now? I've been waiting for your skewering of her for 24 hours. Gosh, um, a bit, yes. That's not what I'm dedicating an hour of the programme to. Um, I, I, I mean, it is an extraordinary PR debacle you know even Laura Koonsberg at the BBC uh, (laughs) couldn't couldn't make life easier for Michelle Moan during this extraordinary interview that she's given about the profit they made on a PPE deal after threatening journalists I've seen some of the legal letters that were sent to journalists threatening legal action the thing about libel is it costs a fortune to defend yourself even if you know you're innocent so I don't know whether she was taking her advice from Andrew Windsor or Gerald Ratner on this one. It's as if Andrew Windsor and Gerald Ratner's approach to uh, brand management <laughs> have been rolled into one and and Michelle Moan has sort of popped out at the end of the process. So I will talk about that a bit this hour and I have got some clips to look at but but I'm um, and I've also got to tell you about the story of, of that I think you know as someone who has been very optimistic about Keir Starmer largely through desperation and necessity I think this time the Mail have genuinely got him banged to rights. I really do. I don't know how he's going to wriggle out of this. It turns out that when he was a barrister in 2002, he got a reprieve for a pet Alsatian called Dino that was on death row. He agreed to fight a destruction order made against dogs, a dog, after the magistrates had ordered him, ordered him to be destroyed. That's a story by the political editor of the Mail on Sunday that was published in a real newspaper yesterday. When Sir Keir was making his name as a left-wing barrister in 2002, the now Labour leader, who last week exploited Tory divisions over whether international human rights laws should stop Britain sending migrants to Rwanda, agreed to fight a destruction order made against Dino. If they have got... He once tried to keep a dog alive... If they honestly think that's going to be a wedge issue with the great British public, then I think they need to give their heads a wobble. But this this is also, of course, the same people that gave us 13 front pages about Keir Starmer's curry. And I think it was the same journalist, actually, who did the story about the donkey sanctuary. He he, he bought a field for his mum to keep donkeys in. She was disabled by this point, and one of her pleasures in life was to to watch the animals, animals they'd rescued from the window at the back of the house. Um, but hey-ho, that was apparently awful because a few, several years later, it turned out the field was worth quite a lot of money when they sold it. So down with that sort of thing. Uh, six minutes after 12 is the time. I have been fascinated by the story of Alex Batty. And and in some ways, as it gets less fascinating, it gets more fascinating. And by that, what I mean is that Alex, and I wish him the absolute best... Sounds, the more I read about, he just sounds like a very lovely young man. A keen cyclist who loved to cook, according to a French family, who say they took him in and treated him as one of their own children. So there are a few stories about Alex in the news today, all of which add to a sense I had on Friday when I thought about talking to you about this subject, but decided not to. Um, It all add to a sense that he is... Escaping the eccentricity of the people looking after him. Now, there are legal questions in play here because his legal guardian was his grandmother and it was on a holiday, an arranged holiday to Spain in October 2017 that he is alleged to have been abducted by his mother, Melanie, and her father, David. Um, Alex was, was 11 at the time. And the phrase that has now appeared a lot in the coverage is off-grid. So the parents, or the, 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 the parent, the mother, wants to live off-grid. The French family who provided him with... So what would happen is that the, the granddad, they got some accommodation on this holiday camp because the granddad was doing some work as a handyman in return for board and lodging. But Alex made himself sort of indispensable 
to the family and the couple that looked after him have said that he would stay with them quite often while his mother searched this part of France looking for somewhere to live. So there are, I didn't know this, there are quite a lot of kind of um, communities, off-grid communities that have found bases in this part of, of France. These are people who believe that a homeowner should not have to pay a mortgage, council tax, electricity, gas, water, uh, or even for a TV license. So they're, they're, it's called off-grid. You may have heard of it, you may not. That's the phrase that they use. So there are some spiritual communities and some off-grid communities, people who have, have sought to opt out of what you might call normal Society, mainstream is a nicer word than normal, I think. They've chose to opt out of mainstream society. And Alex, my favourite headline, is probably the one that he ran away because he wanted to enrol on a computing course. So I hope that the lad is fine. And I hope that he feels at home and secure with his grandma, who he's back with now. But there is, there is a comical dimension to this because from what we currently know, it seems that he was almost rebelling against his unconventional mother by being a really nice and normal young lad. And he wanted to run away not to join the circus, which is, of course, the traditional trope for a child rebelling against family background. He wanted to enroll on a computer course. It's almost like he wanted to run away and become an accountant. And... I want you to tell me, for reasons that I will explain a little further, I want you to tell me what you think he is currently going through. And I'll tell you why I want you to do that in a minute. But first, I just want to say hello to Vinny, because he's just texted. And Vinny, I did get the book that you gave me at the Union Chapel, and uh, off you and your partner, and I absolutely love it. So thank you. I, I'm, I'm sorry that I haven't said thank you for that before. I'm so glad that I spotted that text and, and fairly strong, fairly confident that you uh, are still listening when I got around to, to, to noting it. So, so here's what I want from you. Okay. What is it like to grow up with really, really unconventional parents? Now, this could be anything from a religious cult or what we call a cult. I doubt that they called it a cult at the time when you were in it or, you know, full on hippies. The, you know, the, 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 the real kind of tune in, turn on, drop out kind of hippies. It could be strong religion. It doesn't have to be cultish. It could just be a very self-contained religious community or like Alex, it could be having a mum who wanted to live outside of the confines of normal society, man. And you had no choice in the matter as a child. You had no choice in the matter. So I want to know what it's like to realize that you don't want to be part of a process that your parent or parents have dedicated their entire lives to. I know what you're thinking. You don't make it easy for us, do you, James, as listeners? Someone's sitting there thinking, oh, I like this show. I think I'd, I'd love to ring in. You're waiting for a question about parking tickets or, or, or I don't know, uh, immigration or something. What, what do you want? You want me to have look at, spend my entire childhood living in a non-conventional community chosen by my parents, from which when I reached puberty and, and adolescence, I decided that I wanted to live. Yes, that's, that's exactly what I'm asking for. You should know by now that this isn't a normal radio phone-in programme. 11 minutes after 12 is the time. What, what is it like when... When rejecting your parents' choices involves being what the world would consider to be the sensible way. It's like, do you, do you understand why I'm so interested in this? It's like the corollary of normal rebellion. Normal rebellion involves running away to join the circus. Alex's rebellion appears to involve running away because he'd had enough of living off-grid and wanted to sign up for a computer course. So what what is it like when your parents have chosen to live outside of conventional stroke normal society when you reach an age 
at which you can take decisions for yourself, okay? 0345 973 is the number that you need. As far as we know, the family that looked after Alex said she was looking for a place to live in a community. Um, La Bastide, which is where they live, doesn't have this ambition, nor are we a spiritual community. So there are little groups dotted around this part of France where, you know, I, I think a Times journalist went and, and found some of them. They were all bathing in a, in a hot spring and doing yoga, just living outside conventional society. And I've never really thought of it from a child's point of view before. I've always thought of it as being a free choice, an odd choice, perhaps an eccentric choice, a choice that I don't fully understand. But I'd never really thought about it as being a child's life as well. The child is caught up in this, despite not having had any real say, any more than the rest of us do as children, in the circumstances in which we are brought up. And then you reach an age where you think, I don't want to live like this. I don't want to live according to the opt-out choices that my parents have made. And that's why you would know better than I would, A, what that's like, and B, what, what Alex would be going through now. Um, hit the numbers now, you will get through. 0345 6060 They've discovered his real name and his real story just this week in the press, but they say we wish him the best of luck. This is a French couple, Frédéric Hamby and Ingrid Bove, who said he arrived at their guest house in southwest France in late autumn 2021 and then became a, a, a much loved member of their family, a keen cyclist who loved to cook. He would um, look after their children, became part of our family, had good relations with our kids, and they released their account yesterday as a statement as the jigsaw of where Alex has been for the last six years begins to be assembled. So I, I, I don't want to open the door to mockery necessarily, but the more outrageous or unconventional your parents' lifestyle choices were, the more qualified I think you are to contribute to this conversation. Paul in Sunbury's just pointed out that I am asking for people who live off grid to call me. I'm not, am I though, Paul? I did once very nearly launch a phone in exclusively for people who didn't have a phone. I, I literally, I was halfway through asking the question. There was a story in the newspaper about the percentage of the population that had no phone. I read out the story and I then got halfway through the sentence of saying, if you haven't got a phone, give me a ring now and call into the program. But Paul, pay attention. This is about people who were raised in an off-grid scenario, but chose to leave it. And I want to know what that's like. It must be really tough as well. I, I say that there's a light-hearted element to this story, but it must be really tough to reject in some sense your parents' lifestyle choices, it, it, to, to, to walk away from all that you've ever known. This lad, it seems to me, has uh, uh, somehow managed to retain extremely high levels of good sense despite being exposed to um, very extraordinary circumstances. Laura in Renfrew points out that if I say what's it like again, I'll have to tell all the new listeners the story about the lad at school who, uh, who turned that into a catchphrase. It has indeed been a while, Laura, but I don't know that I will... Um, uh, 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 I don't know that I will share that story again today. We've got quite a lot to get through this hour, but we'll start with this. So it's the Times today describe it as a cult-like off-grid movement based around the belief that a homeowner should not have to pay a mortgage, council tax, electricity, gas or water bills, or even for a TV licence. If you've grown up in something like that and then reached an age where you thought, do you know what, I'd quite like to live in conventional society, what is that process like? Okay, 0345 6060 973. What is it like as you get into your mid to late teens to realise that you want to reject the very unconventional and or off-grid or religious choices Un, uh, made by your parents under which you have lived your entire life. I'm fascinated. I really hope this works because I find the subject absolutely fascinating. But if it doesn't, we'll probably talk about parking tickets. James O'Brien on LBC. 
James O'Brien on LBC. 90 minutes after 12, Bob's in Norfolk. He says, James, if this setup explanation goes on any longer, I'm going to consider living off grid. I, it was it was a slightly longer winded one than usual, which by my standards is quite a remarkable achievement. But that's because I, I feel sometimes I'm not properly explaining what it is that I'm interested in. But hey ho, I've done my best and we'll see how it works. Ah, you got it. V, VT got it in Camden. Um, it's the absolutely fabulous scenario where Alex Batty is sat, Safi, that's Julia Sawala's character, who is very, very straight-laced, isn't she? Very square, we would have said when we were kids. And her mother is uh, dysfunctional and, uh, and chaotic. So you rebel against your parents by being the sensible one. 0345 60973. And this isn't quite what I was looking for, but I can't not share it. It's not exactly what you asked for, James, but my mother inherited a house in a nudist holiday camp in the north of Germany. I cannot tell you how much we dreaded the summer holidays. That, now, if you'd lived in that community, then that would be what I'm looking for today. But in the circumstances, I am prepared to accept holidays. Uh, Julia is in Tottenham. Julia, what made you pick up the phone? Oh, good morning, Hello. James. Um, this is the first time I've actually had this conversation out, out loud. So, uh, Gosh. But it is positive. So, um, yes, I, I grew up with parents like this, which meant um, my early years were spent living in caravans at the side of the road, on farms. Gosh. Moving around, evading, I'd say ev- evading authorities, but not in a law-breaking way. No, it was but a, just it, off-grid, it, seeking to, to, to live outside yeah. the matrix, as it were. Yeah, keeping under the radar. Um, and um, my, my sister and I, we didn't go to school um, properly until we were about 11, well, me, 11. Crikey. Um, yeah. Um, and... Um, yeah, well, we did go to school. It was subject to lots of bullying because we were so different and yeah. so weird. I mean, I, I would talk to the teachers like an adult because that's what I was used to because um, I was saying this to the researcher to yes. frame this. Yes. In the way that you do your full disclosure interviews, when you say, tell me about you as a child, hmm. if you asked me that question, I wouldn't have a clue. Not a clue. So you had no concept of being a child. You you were no. always treated as an equal by your parents. No, I no. was controlled by them as oh, well. There was, there was an element of brainwashing there. And what, when did you but, realise that your childhood was extraordinary or abnormal or whatever word you prefer? When, 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 when I was eight years old. So so you got to be as old as eight before you thought I I, I don't have to live like or I shouldn't have to live like this. I I think the overarching thought in my head was. This isn't normal. Yeah. These people are not normal. And oh, so dear. I will refer to my parents as these people because okay. um, not through some sort of damage or, or negative feeling that I have towards them. It's no. just the, the the feelings weren't cultivated properly. It was all, you know, I sound like a pot plant rather, or a dog, you know, rather yes. than a, a, a child that could express opinions because... Okay. If, we did express opinions about, oh, I want to do this. I remember saying I want to do ballet classes because I had a copy of Bunty magazine. This helped, you know, I'm not quite old. I'm about the same age as you. Yeah. But it's like, you don't want to do that. That's what other people do. Okay. We don't live like that. We, we're more sensible than that. That's all stupid. If you think like that, you're stupid. But that would go on for two days. So it would be this machine gunning of ideas um, that didn't make sense. But um, what I will say positively, yeah. what I've heard, um, I'm doing all right for myself, by the way, Good. now. By yeah. the way, I've got, you know, I'll, I'll get to that bit. But so what I've heard about this young lad, yes. he sounds awesome. He does, doesn't he? He's already got it together. He, he, he He's made a decision at some point, go in your words, up oh, with this I will not put. But he's already got it in place what his his next two, three moves are. Yes. So I I, I hope it sounds like he's had some lovely positive he, Well he said people. he said he told he told this French couple he would find a way to return to the UK on his own to get new papers and go back to school. And so it is it and is it, it, it's a rebellion against the unconventional nature of his mum and granddad by wanting to be Conventional. How did you do it when you when you reached eight? What did you do? Did you? Well, how did? If you don't mind study, me asking. Study, study, study. But but, it, but, but you mean autonomously yeah. studying while still living this quite yeah. peripatetic lifestyle? Yeah, 
but not not in their presence because they wouldn't have books in the house. So what? it was literally, I oh, know, <laughs> it's literally anything I could get hold of, including telephone directories, just read, 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 read. Um, when I got to secondary school, age 11, I yes. had no... Uh, so I hadn't done 11 plus so I didn't know I had no metric for whether I was clever or not I thought mm. I was sick because we were always put at the back of the class in the sorry nine primary schools that I did go in and out oh of, you so, poor thing oh no it, it, it that sounds like it's dramatic it's not it's you know what doesn't kill you makes you stronger sort of thing no, you, I know but don't forget way. you know all, all the all the therapy that works involves looking after the child inside looking after the oh I not been able to do therapy because of this when I've sat down with a therapist yes. I don't know how to say it it doesn't sound like I'm either covering up for something yeah. or conflating something to sound like it's over the top just talk to because, her just try and talk well, to little you that's all you don't oh, even need to have the therapy. The and she's quite pleased with me. Well, so then you're much. doing it. And you're doing, that's what you'd get from therapy. That's, you just well, need to tell her that you're going to look after her. You are going to look get, after her. Gonna, the, the, the big turning point was at the, what, my end of my first year at secondary school, when I was convinced I was stupid, um, mm. I came first in the year and everything. And then thought, And then you mm, thought, there's something I'm going clever. on here. There's something perhaps going I'm on clever. here. And do you have yeah. any relationship now with, with your parents? No. None at all? No. What about your sibling? No, I, I haven't fallen out with them, you know. They've just got nothing I, in common. Are, are they I'm still just... are they still living in the way that they were when you were young? Oh no, I oh, know. Once once we started getting older, and they realised that, um, especially because I was doing well at school, so they would the school would keep inviting them for things and stuff. They realised they had to do something to buck their ideas up. Yeah, well, you need but, you need a bit of security and safety, I suppose, that comes... That's another thing. that I don't know whether it's a Darwinian type of community. What happens if you get really sick and you're living off-grid, as it were? I, I do get the attraction. Thank you, Julia. It's 26 minutes after 12. I do get the attraction of it. I just... And, and, and lots of you... Well, not that many, but at least half a dozen people pointing out that John Major ran away from the circus to become an accountant. I don't know if that is technically true, but I think it might be. I mean, I don't think he was ever going to follow his father into the... It was the Major Balls, wasn't it, they were called? Because I knew his brother, actually, back in the day, Terry Major Ball, and I think the dad had been in the circus, and then he set up a garden gnome business in Brixton, and, and young John worked as a bus conductor while he was doing his accountancy exam. So I think it's fair to say that John Major didn't want... Ah, oh, that's the phrase I've been looking for since 12 o'clock today. Counterculture. He didn't want much to do with the counterculture. So your parents chose counterculture or, or religion. I mean, what's being homeschooled was probably the entry level for this kind of thing. And you, when you reached a certain age, you decided that you didn't want it. Uh, New is in Brighton. New, what would you like to say? We may never find out. I think they've got to us. 27 minutes after 12 is the time. Looking for the idea of a child rejecting the counterculture lifestyle decisions of a parent, partly due to the conversation uh, or the story, the unfolding story of Alex Batty, and partly just because I, I find it absolutely fascinating. Um, 27 after 12 is the time. Sarah's in Edinburgh. Sarah, what made you pick up the phone? Oh, hello. Oh, hello. Um, well, it's not my own my own experience, but my uncle lives completely off the grid, and um, he doesn't like to be a part of you know normal society. He doesn't like living in houses, and he had three children, my cousins, who were yes. a bit younger than me, so I sort of look, look, looked after them quite often. Right. And um, the they, he brought them up on his own, and they lived in boats. You know, that he pulled up from the Thames and fixed and trucks and vans and all sorts of vehicles. And they travelled around the country. Uh, and it has a childhood not like anyone else's that I, I knew. And they were completely unspoiled, fantastic children. Mm. Really, really wonderful what was children. Their, what was their dad rejecting? What was he What was he rejecting? He doesn't like being told what to do. Okay. <laughs> He's got his own ideas. Yes. And he likes to follow his own ideas. And he doesn't like living in bricks and squares. Fair he, enough. He likes living on in in vehicles that move. And what and happened when your cousins began to reach an age where they realised that they had free choice as well? Well, they didn't. 
they didn't go to school when they were growing up much. I mean, here and there occasionally, but then they'd move again. And then when they realised, when they, when they, uh, you know, when they became sort of teenagers, mm. they decided for themselves that they wanted to go to school. Yeah, it's so, so funny, went, isn't that funny? Themselves. And they've grown up. One is a fantastic midwife, and the oh. other one uh, fixes yachts, and the other one makes wedding dresses. And they are the most, uh, you know, I, I have so much admiration for them because they are only ever sort of happy with life, completely grateful. They never complain about anything. They never moan. You know, they, they just enjoy life to the full. So there's and no no got negative. Real wisdom. So there's no negative to well, I, put, I mean, in a sense, they rejected some of their dad's choices, but it hasn't. Yeah, they live in bricks. <laughs> <laughs> and is he I still is he still is he still floating around the place? Oh yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. I, I, I think I think that the conformism. Thank you, Sarah. That's another lovely story. Two remarkable stories. Um, it, it, it is. It, I mean, there is a so societal straitjacket in the in the. the idea of rejecting took a call last week didn't we about the role that capitalism has played in so many of the problems that the world never mind the country faces there, there is probably a bit guilty of it myself a, a temptation to sneer and sniff at people choosing to plow a very different furrow but it doesn't mean that they're wrong and it doesn't mean that the outcomes will be disastrous maybe that's why we derive comfort from discovering that Safi syndrome exists and that rebelling against dysfunctional or chaotic parents involves doing all of the things that most of us grow up thinking we don't want to do. Oh, I'd love to be able to go to school. You, you, you can't quite get your head around that if you spent your own childhood wishing that you didn't have to. So but am I right in thinking of chocolate factories at this point? I'm just sort of you know, thinking of chocolate. If you work in a chocolate factory, you very quickly get sick of chocolate. You spend your life, you wake up every morning, oh God, I don't have to go to school. And then your dad announces that you're all going to go and live in a skip in the, in the middle of the door doin or something. I, I, after a month, you'd be dreaming of coming back and actually having order and, and routine in your life. I do not know. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 12.34. Mark writes, I'm someone who left a controlling and cult-like religion well into adulthood, James after being raised in it by a parent. I can imagine Alex has wrestled with the inner conflict of needing to protect himself and his future on the one hand and the guilt and fear of abandonment or judgment by members of his own family on the other. It's not easy to face and that conflict might not go away just because he's made the decision. I wish him all the success and luck that he deserves. That, reading that, made me think of Louis Theroux's um, programs with the Westboro Baptist Church, including the, you know, the ones who th protest soldiers coming home because they think it's God's dead soldiers being brought home from war zones because they think it's God's punishment for homosexuality. I forget the precise details of their doctrine. But Louis's done some amazing programs with those people, especially the ones with the daughter that left. And what, what Mark describes there about the tension between protecting yourself and guilt and fear of abandonment or judgment by other members of the family that stay behind. That's huge. Um, I'm also told that off-grid is becoming uh, another other for right-wing press to attack a very small but varied group of people scattered across the country and continent. So I will be mindful of that. Um, and I've also been reminded that the uh, that Dale Vince Full Disclosure podcast was one of the ones I found most fascinating. And Dale, um, known now for ecotricity and his work as a as a green entrepreneur, he went off grid in his mid to late teens. And in many ways, he's never gone back on it again. And and leads an incredibly productive and uh, uh, exciting life. Twelve thirty six is the time. New is in Brighton. New, what made you pick up the phone? Um, so I am a disabled person living in Brighton and I stopped being unconventional with my family before the pandemic because they asked me to run away with them to Portugal um, when the pandemic started. And I was at university as an animation student. Oh. So I lead an unconventional life anyway. What, what um, was your autistic, childhood? You know? well, let's start with your childhood if we can. What, what I mean, yeah. and, 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 and work towards the point where we'll all understand why your family wanted to run away to Portugal at the outbreak of the pandemic. Um, so in 1992, I suffered medical negligence, um, forceps, and I've been in a 
powered wheelchair ever since. Oh. And then when I was nine years old, my mother died of a brain tumour. Right. Uh, my dad was left all on his own to look after me and I was put in a documentary called My Heart Belongs to Dad when okay. I was 14 years old. Um, long story short, my dad has basically kind of been betrayed by the medical system and is now an anti-vaxxer living in Portugal. Right. So was that, I mean, did that mark your whole childhood or was it just a, a, a kind of it moment? Mark it, but I felt very different to a lot of people who are disabled and autistic. I'm autistic as well. Yes. Um, because of the fact that I grew up around hippie parents with a different kind of ideology. And they didn't trust so, conventional medicine, not not least because of what had happened to you. Well, my dad met my stepmom, who um, quite, kind of went through a similar situation, but thankfully, because of conventional medicine, um, her son, who had, who had a... Um, yeah, cancer thing. I can't yeah. remember exactly what kind of cancer. Okay. But thanks to chemotherapy, he uh, survived. Um, ah, but, okay. but now uh, is in a weird ayahuasca kind of group <laughs> who um, who mostly live in all over the world, but um, have a little settling in Portugal. So, um, and now so, my little brother, who's the youngest, yes. about 12 now, um, and him and uh, my stepmom and my dad all live in Portugal, in uh, Albedrina. And is that another so, yeah. hub for these kind of lifestyles? Uh, it, well, it's hard for, for my 12-year-old brother because um, he doesn't know. Uh, he, he doesn't really know what's going on. He's living out in the middle of nowhere, uneducated, not vaccinated and undiagnosed. And uh, most, most people will think, oh, no, he's not autistic. But autism doesn't work that way. <laughs> um, autism comes in many different... Uh, yes, of course. So is that I just want that corner of Portugal that you describe? Is that like this this part of France that we're reading about, somewhere where yeah, very people much so. trying to to get out of the what, what do we call, what's a, what's a nicer way of talking about it? No, because I don't want to fall into the trap of of of, mal, of maligning everybody that wants to live a, a slightly unconventional life or, or or to live outside of the parameters of. I think living an alternative lifestyle, as we call it, yes. Is, great right, and it's like it's exciting in a lot of ways but also if you chose to run away from your responsibilities during the pandemic it's kind of makes you irresponsible and a little bit selfish sorry yes. I, I do have strong feelings as you can you don't hear. need to apologize to me for your strong feelings what how did the situation escalate what were the sort of conversations you were having and how did you make the no, final I was told that well i was told by my stepmom in particular that if i went near my brother and i was vaccinated that i would be poisoning him and stuff Oh, and the, like all that kind of stuff and that kind of escalated so badly to the point where we didn't really talk but now we are talking and I'm still talking to my dad but there's a lot of uh, angry hurt feelings I'm 31 now right. and I live on my I live with my partner in Brighton and I'm very happy Good. but the feelings and the hurt from the pandemic it's it's still held on was that I still, was that I still feel quite betrayed I'm sure by, you do and and would your condition would your disability did it did it make you immunocompromised did you have to would, would catching covid have been particularly problematic for you or or, or not it, it, I actually had covid a few times right. um but because I have asthma and weak lungs yes. um, it would have made it quite dangerous for me and my carers who look after me so if you'd been unvaccinated it it, it, it it probably would have been worse and you could have been putting yourself exactly. in on told on what an awful decision to have to take what an awful choice you were given really by, by uh, i mean i i love my family very much i and can we tell used to be very close but yes. yeah you know it's... can i ask about the moment of a fracture no where you actually you know the point of no return as it were well the point of no return came a few years before that when i okay. had an abusive relationship with somebody who kind of made me believe that my parents were bad but then i went back together right. with my parents and left the abusive relationship and long story short I kind of had a moment of clarity when I was halfway through my university years yeah. where I realised that it's a kind of cultist right-wing mentality that my parents have. Right. But it's actually not uncommon for a lot of hippie communities to go into kind of that mindset. It's like a horseshoe almost. Or as you saw rejecting society for some reasons and you end up rejecting it for others. What, what, other, what other beliefs would they have apart from the medical science and the vaccine stuff? What, what other things would they be opposed it to? Kind of, it kind of revolves around... Nazi, world order, right. Earth kind of style stuff. Yeah. And it kind of revolves around the same kind of mentality that they are the victims and everyone else around them are the 
evil the, the lemmings or the sheep so and in order to believe that people are trying to do um harm to you with something that's designed to protect the population you have to already be susceptible to the idea that there are dark forces operating under every level of our existence that only they have the, think, the knowledge of or the understanding of i think there is a level of narcissism that happens within most hippie communities okay um, that don't get talked about and the that's mentality around that i think it's really dangerous and it's mostly perpetuated by white hippie guys <laughs> and finally the conversation you had when they said we're all going to portugal and you said no we're not how was that what happened then right in the middle of my class and my classmates just kind of turned around looked at me and I went outside so it was really embarrassing already because I had the phone on speakerphone and I realized what was going on and I was like oh my god so I went out of my class yeah and then uh, I ended up having like a full hour conversation with them out of my class to try and convince my parents that this was a bad idea but then a couple of months during the pandemic they went anyway and I actually kind of them go because they were driving me so mad I just kind of wanted to be by myself good grief and 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 you are doing better now than you did before. Distance has helped, yeah. They don't see it that way. They're still upset that I'm not living this fan fanatical hippie lifestyle with them in the middle of nowhere. But as a disabled person, we don't get those kind of luxuries. Yeah. I, I, if you would call it a luxury. <laughs> Uh, well, I, I mean, you would. That's the point, isn't it? Is that people, and, and actually, I know I said that was the final question, but presumably... I, I wouldn't call it a luxury. I'm very happy with my life here, and I've made some good decisions. And I'm very glad health, to hear my that. Health, my mental health. So, how, yeah. how hard do other people find it to understand what you went through? It's, it's, uh, it's complicated. I, I'm writing a lot of stuff at the moment. Maybe I'll put it into a book. Who knows? I look forward to it now, and I, and, I, and I wish you well. Um, uh, Twelve, it's coming up to quarter to one. I mean, you know, they're always out there. So Sam is in Cheshire, and he says, imagine raving about vaccine efficacy with someone who was vaccinated and caught COVID several times. Five years ago, this would be a nonsensical conversation. The vaccine was designed to make the symptoms of COVID less severe for vaccinated people than they would otherwise have been for unvaccinated people. It is why the doctors, Sam, working in intensive care with people on ventilators were so utterly distraught and frustrated whenever people unvaccinated came into their hospital. The vaccine is not like a magic bullet that means you'll never catch it. It means that if you do catch it, the symptoms will usually be much less severe. And the fact that I still have to explain this five years later is why you're the first entry today. For Idiot's Corner. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 12.48 is the time. I, I, I do sort of wonder whether this is one of those subjects that I should be a little bit more open-minded about. I, I mean, given that most of the stories we've heard were very negative about the experience of growing up with hippie or short or non-conventional parents. But... I, 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 I'll tell you why I'm wondering that, because I've got a really good text here from David in Fairham. If it doesn't give you food for thought, then it, it should do. I think we're all conditioned to be dismissive, often to the point of bullying, of people who have made choices that sometimes make us question our own. I think it's why vegetarians and particularly vegans come in for so much fairly ridiculous abuse, something I used to be guilty of myself. I think it's because of the three fingers pointing back at you when you point one finger at somebody else, the idea of you're stupid, you're a vegetarian, and the three fingers pointing back at you saying, well, you eat sentient organisms, and maybe you're the one with the problem here. So there's always a bit of that. Homeschooling, I think, is probably entry-level non-conventional living and the fear what if they're right and we're wrong is probably part of the reason why we are tempted to be a little bit sneery perhaps or suspicious about homeschooling david in fairham has really made me think about that i read this text just during that last um hiatus 
and he says, hi, James, my wife home educates our children. They're aged 10 and 7. We involved them in the decision and leave the possibility of going to school open. They have improved in every subject since leaving the school environment and their mental health has improved. They take part in lots of social and educational activities with other home learners and they love learning again. We used to stand at the school gate with the other parents discussing all the shortcomings of the education system and then we thought, well, why don't we do something about it? So we did. My children have resources and they go on trips. They get experiences they could never get in the school setting. I work full time. My wife works part time. We have to be careful with money because we don't have two full time incomes anymore. But I believe that they are getting the best education they could have. And that's worth it. I, I don't know. I, I just know that usually when I catch myself being very knee jerk dismissive of people doing things that I choose not to do. I look back on it um, uh, uh, from the post-therapy perspective and think that I was probably a little bit previous. I, I was probably a little bit, um, I think, judgy is the word. I don't think that this is going to apply to the Michelle Moan case. I took a view this morning that there wasn't a phone-in in it. But actually, the, the question that I would have asked if we had done a phone-in remains unanswered. Do you remember at the beginning of COVID funny that, that that's back on our, our, our conversation this morning the beginning of covid when i told you i was getting messages from people that i hadn't heard from in years because i was the only person in the media that, that was in their orbit so i got a couple of messages from the like lads i'd been at school with when i was 10 or 11 years old it was on facebook because you can still obviously keep contact with people that you haven't seen forever. And it would just say, look, mate, I'm probably being mad, but you're the only person I know in the media. And I've been sent this little film. And it would be a clip of someone trying to sabotage a 5G phone mast because can you remember what that story was? Was the phone mast going to give us COVID? Is that what it was? And and it was it was sensibly put together. And it was people claiming that they'd worked for various organisations. And, you know, lads, obviously I haven't seen them for a very long time. But they would be bright and educated and informed people. But the scale and the nature of the misinformation was such that they reached out to the only person they knew in the media for a quick steer on, on what was going on. And I, I was obviously delighted to, um, uh, to, to help them out. I got a couple yesterday. I really wasn't expecting it. I just got two. So it wasn't like the COVID when I got about 20. But I got two yesterday just saying, what is... What is the thinking behind Michelle Moan giving this interview to the BBC? Michelle Moan and her husband set up contracts via the, the so-called VIP lane with the government. She is, of course, a, a Conservative member of the House of Lords. And, and they were um, commissioned to supply tens of millions of pounds worth of PPE to the government. The government is currently suing them because they uh, claim that the PPE was defective. And, and here's the crucial bit. Michelle Moan threatened to sue journalists who suggested that she had a link to these companies that were providing the PPE. I've seen some of the legal letters that she sent out. David Conn at The Guardian is probably the best chronicler of, of the extent of what was going on. It was so like proper, proper, um, proper threats of legal action, which is terrifying. I, I, you know, however thick your skin is, if you think you've made a mistake and the person about whom you have made the mistake is preparing to sue you, it's a very chilling experience. It's a very chilling moment. It's not it never happened to me, but I, I, I've had it described to me by people to whom it has happened. And she's elected to give this full-length interview to the BBC, which I don't think should have happened, but it's the same journalist that let Matthew Elliott from Vote Leave offer up his rejection of the Electoral Commission's findings that vote leave had broken electoral law two weeks before the Electoral Commission was able to, to, to fully publish them. So the editorial decisions are, are a different matter entirely. Uh, and it certainly didn't go well for Michelle Moan and her husband, Doug Barrowman. But I get the message, the question of why did she do this? I don't think you're going to have time to answer it. But let's start with the, the amount of money they made on this PPE deal. How much were you paid and how much of it was profit? So the, the, the two contracts in total came to a value of, uh, of £202 mil, million. Pounds. And, uh, you know, MedPro made a, made a return on its investment of about, uh, realistically, about 30%. So about £60 million? Or... Yeah, yeah, about that, yeah. That's right. That's... 
It's Carol Vorderman who, who 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 said to me, or I said to her, I can't remember. It was it was during full disclosure that when most people saw a tragedy or saw an opportunity to step up and be patriotic, some people saw a financial opportunity, and there they are. That's what it sounds like. Even there in their voices, not even a scintilla of questioning. Um, in fact, she she still continues to say that she doesn't know what she's done wrong. This is, remember, the kind of car- caliber of character that David Cameron put into the House of Lords. And I mention that because that's a gold standard compared to the sort of flotsam and jetsam that Boris Johnson subsequently ennobled. Here she is explaining why, and I'm just going to say these words slowly, why they lied to journalists and threatened them with legal action. When it became public that you were connected to the company, you both denied it. Why? I wasn't trying to pull the wool over anyone's eyes and I regret and I'm sorry for not saying straight out, yes, I am involved because DHSC, the NHS, um, the Cabinet Office, they all knew of my involvement. But I didn't want the press intrusion for my family. My family have gone through hell with the media over you know, my career and I didn't want another big hoo-ha in the press. Over a period of months, yep. you said again and again mm-hmm. that you had no connection. And your lawyers even said to some journalists it would be defamatory, they'd be libelling you if they told the truth. You know, this just wasn't a slip-up. Yeah. You didn't tell the truth for months I think on if end. we were to say of anything that we have done, we've done a lot of good, but if we were to say anything that we have done, that we are sorry for, and that's not to, that's we should have told the press straight up, straight away, yeah, nothing to hide. And again, I'm sorry for that, but I wasn't trying to pull the wool over anyone's eyes. No one. But that's exactly what you were trying to do. You had lawyers working for both of you, telling people, telling the public that you had nothing to do with the company. Yeah. And saying it would have been a libel to suggest that you were. Yeah. But it's something that we regret doing and we listen to our advisors. <laughs> um, anyway, I mean, quite why she's in so much trouble is anybody's guess, because apparently the, the, but none of the profits earned were hers anyway. It's not my money. I don't have that money and my kids don't have that money. And my children, my family have gone through so much pain because of the media they have not got £29 million. And this money from PP Medpro, as I understand it, went into two trusts. Yeah. Now, one of those trusts called Keristol. Yes. The beneficiaries of that trust, where half of the profit went, are you and your children. As and Doug's saying. children, and my children too. For the benefit of all my family. I'm his wife, so I'm a beneficiary as well as his children, as well as my children. You've said repeatedly you didn't financially benefit from this deal, except it's just a matter of time of when you benefit. Mm -hmm. It's my income, it's taxed on my tax return, and actually if I die one day in the future, she's going to directly benefit. As a family, you are benefiting from those tens of millions of pounds. Uh, If anyone wants to put a few million quid in trust for me, I am quite happy to say on the record that I have not benefited in any way, shape or form from you putting a few million, what an abs, so I don't know, I may take a view tomorrow uh, on whether or not there is a phone in on the question of why on earth they've done this, why on earth have they done this, unless they're being advised by Gerald Ratner and Andrew Windsor on brand management, I cannot for the life of me work out why they'd even consider doing such a thing. Ah, we shall see. We've got nothing to hide, um, points out Joe, says the woman who spent months hiding. If you missed any of today's show, you can listen back to the whole show podcast on Global Player, where you can also pause and rewind live radio. All LBC's shows are there to catch up on, as well as your opportunity to stay right up to date with all the latest news from LBC. Pause and rewind live radio on Global Player, where you're always in control. Download for free from your app store or head to globalplayer.com. James O'Brien on LBC. 